difference is fine. All right, we're moving on. <laughs> moving yeah, not, on. I'm just really, looking at it. It's, it's not that anything. Okay. Everyone News needs to chill out. is great. Don't be misled by the news. No news is good news with Gary Good News. Oh, I remember Gary yeah, Good News. Great no news is good news, also. Oh. Hey, everyone, we're here doing a show. I'm not a robot. Are you a robot? I'm not a robot. I'm here. Oh, thanks. We're so. We're here. We're so excited to be here to do another episode of This Week in Science to talk about all the science that we can fit in a show from the last week and yeah to hang out with you because this is a great time to be together to talk about science welcome to this week in science we're going to record the show uh it may not be the entire show that becomes the podcast so this is just the live recording are we ready oh we're i'm ready. ready we're so ready almost Almost, almost, kind of. Let me copy and paste and open that. Almost, almost. Uh, everybody can, just uh, sit tight sit, for like another 15 minutes and then uh, I'll be ready as well. No. <laughs> All right, I'll wing it then. After this many years, you better be able to wing it because we're starting the show in... Who's got clicky noises? Is that Blair? Oh, it's the dog. All mute. <laughs> okay. She's chewing a bone. Just mute the, All just mute. mute the dog. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mute your dog, Blair. In three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 816, recorded on Wednesday, March 17th, 2021. How do Irish eyes? Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your heads with bad air, destruction, and a cosmic shipwreck. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Those who control the present control the future. We current humans are here but for a short while. When we are gone, the world will move on with new humans. New humans with new ideas, new solutions to old challenges, and new challenges of their own. But we are here now, and the future, even the future we will not be here for, is very much ours to see. While we are here, it is a future we can do something about. We may not feel the responsibility of the moment. We may not be so altruistically inclined to sacrifice work and invest in causes beyond our immediate need. But if we do not act, if we do nothing, we will have no say in how our history will be written. Those who control the present control the future. And nowhere are the signs of what is at stake greater than here on This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go. To find the knowledge I seek, I wanna know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back yet again to talk about science. Hey, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's why I'm not wearing any green. Something about snakes <laughs> and again. Ireland. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, gonna keep I'm sure my... they were perfectly nice snakes. They were just minding their own business. But, you know. <laughs> well, you know, they were minding their own business until the Irish were like, get out of here, you snakes. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need any of those. But I'm sure their ecosystems still would appreciate a few snakes. However, they didn't have... get them all. There's no way. <laughs> no, they didn't get them all. Yeah. We... Wait, wait, what? Did they ever what? have snakes to begin with? 
Yes, of course. I thought it was because it, it was everywhere. I thought it was because it was like some island that didn't have snakes. And then there was a story. It's like, oh yeah, you know how how that came about? Why? I don't know. There's this guy who like chased them all away. That's not it. They have snakes. We, no, we have to figure. Top of the show. First question. Does Ireland even have snakes? Yes, of course they have snakes. I don't know. It this. has lots of snakes. It's a okay, myth. So, it's a myth. It's a myth. Okay, never mind. Oh wait. Huh? Well, there are snakes. They've probably been brought there by other species. Oh, they're invasive. Okay. Okay. So there was. <laughs> so the myth has its origin in the fact that people who were there who was like, "There's no snakes here," and then, "Oh yeah, let me tell you a story about how that happened." And then that was a myth. And then people had snakes as pets, and they got loose. And now. Right. So it has a uh, serpent-free reputation, uh, but people own lots of snakes and there are wild escaped snakes. Um, but according to mentalfloss.com... Which, the... is, which is a very trustable... <laughs> Very reputable site. As of yet, Not no bad. species has managed to take hold in the wild. Okay. Oh, so, so yes, that... and then the other the other thing that I found was three million years ago when Ireland left mainland Europe. Yes, there were obviously many snakes, but what happened was when the ice age came, the cold blooded critters died out, and they have not since been able to get oh, back. They haven't been able to take over ecosystems. Yeah. Look how good a show, show we do when we just wing it. Let's just go. Let's bad. just ask Which questions and bad. answer them. Let's yeah. figure them out. Part of being a scientist is like being a really good crunch Google time it. fact checker, right? Yeah, well, the Google right. stuff. When you is it, a myth? Find the is truth. it true? Let's do this. All right, good. Did anyone save a spider this weekend? I didn't. Well, kill Blair, a I'm not even asking you. I didn't kill any spiders? I know <laughs> I'm trying to avoid that. Anyway, I definitely didn't not save any spiders this weekend. <laughs> It's like, come on, well, spider, I'm going to rescue. No, no, this is my home. I live here. No, no, come on, I'm going to get you out of No, 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 please yeah, leave me alone. I just, I'm too, fine is, right where I am. As long as a spider is not, like, I don't know, near the head of my bed or in I, my food, I'm happy with them living in the home because they're getting rid of other yucky things. Okay, well, this weekend was Save a Spider Day on Sunday. So if you did save a spider on Sunday... Congrats to you. Mm -hmm. um, that was also in the process of losing an hour of sleep for daylight savings time, which is still very contested, as you will see in many media articles and across social media this week. People Boo. fighting <laughs> fighting for standard time, other people fighting for daylight savings time. Uh, I don't know. I think uh -uh. if we could just pick one, it would be a lot easier. Just pick one. Why are we moving around? Why are we messing with our circadian rhythms? Well, it's the circadian rhythm stuff that's really the issue, isn't it? Yeah. Is it so, even? Like, it's not a big deal. Just deal with it. I'm so know. tired. Still. It's... Okay. Then we, we can't figure it out. Then can we get rid of leap years? And, like, can we make the, all of the months have the same number? Because it's ridiculous. That right. Let's this have 13, one, let's have 13 months of all the same length. And <laughs> 13 months just... of the same length. Actually, yeah. it works. Uh, you could also do, because then it's four weeks a month. That's that's yeah. the brilliant one. Yeah. That's yeah. the right one. Perfect. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> this is all time-related math. And on this St. Patrick's Day, wait, no, Pie Day. Did anyone get to eat a pie? <gasps> We missed pie day on Sunday. Yeah, I almost time. didn't eat a pie, but one of my friends magically, mysteriously had a pie delivered to my front oh. door. Oh nice. my. Well oh, that's great. That's like you you mixed sneak a zucchini day, which is also on the calendar. It was sneak a pie day. <laughs> it was sneak awesome. Sneak a pie day. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Jojo and Heather. <gasps> ah. All right, so let's get to the science. Enough with all of these special dates. March is big. There's a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, we have great stories. I've got stories about Irish eyes and eyes of all kinds, really. And I've also got no womb. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> Well, no, story. No, no room? No womb. Oh, no okay. womb. We'll talk about that <laughs> in a few. <laughs> Justin, what did you bring? I have got uh, Sunken Treasure of Cosmic Design, 
bad air that is really old, fast food, go figure, why oceans are worth protecting, and the green acres of the Arctic. Ooh, I was going to start singing the green acres. Green acres where I used to be. Greenland in the Arctic, I see. Okay, um, Blair, the animal yes. corner. Yes, the animal corner tonight is for the birds. I have a story about birds that can't mate, and I have a story about birds that can't parent. So some 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 birds with some trouble today. And then I also for the quick stories at the very beginning, I have a story about why masks are bad. I mean, they're good. We know that they're good, but they're also bad. And we're going to talk about it. Okay, fantastic. As we jump into all of the science, I would like to remind everyone that if you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can subscribe to us on the YouTubes, on the Facebooks, on Twitch. You can also find us all podcast players that are out there. I'm pretty sure pretty much all of them look for This Week in Science. You can also head to our website, twistywis.org. All right, ready for some science. No womb for the science. Oh. And maybe it's not a problem. Maybe it's not a problem if there's no womb. Huh? What? Is that what you're waiting for? The what yeah. are you talking huh? about? Why do you keep yes. saying the word womb? We need That's wombs. Like, wombs subtly. are part of the deal for... But, but what if they weren't needed necessarily? No, 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 no. no. That's not... Or maybe a synthetic womb instead. Researchers just published in Nature their work on mouse embryos, keeping alive little mouse embryos for um, a couple of weeks, actually. Initially, they were trying to grow embryos in a, a nice embryo embryonic fluid bath, and they were able to keep them alive for about three or four days. But... Um, but then the, the cellular development didn't go much further and the embryos ended up dying. And the researchers played around with a bunch of ideas and eventually realized that they needed to increase the air pressure and oxygen delivery. And so they created a mechanism through which they could deliver the, uh, the, the needed oxygen nutrients to uh, these growing baby mice and they were able then to keep the mice alive for up to 11 days to a much later state of development you know it's not not fancy it's a bunch of lab equipment really and uh, modified centrifuges um, modified pumps moving fluid around stirring little balls of cells blast blastocysts uh, blastocysts, the hollow ball of cells, um, the gastrula, and taking them to a point where they actually started to grow organs inside of the cells. They differentiated and began to grow organs. Um, this is the first time this has been done. It uh, potentially, for lab research situations, opens up, according to a developmental biologist on the Science Magazine website, Magdalena zernica Goetz. It opens new doors by making embryos accessible for a detailed study of many aspects of their development. So being able to not just culture cells up to a certain state, but actually get to the next stages of development without having to go into a uh, the pregnant womb, remove these cells and do that aspect of study, it's um, going to be a lot easier to push the process of research forward. Um, How is this different from Lambex? Yeah, so that's the that's a great question. So it's the opposite direction. Um, Lambags were for or are for what we've reported on before these synthetic wombs that in effect are great for late term. Okay. Uh, births, so or early term births. So when premature births happen, these mm -hmm. lamb bags could be a nurturing nutrient environment. I mean, right now they're called lamb bags because they're being studied yeah. using lambs. Uh, but the idea is that they would be able to give that womb-like experience to a premature baby that can't survive on its own. 
or that needs a little bit more support for just a little bit longer. Um, and it could, so the, the, the lamb bags are coming from the end of pregnancy, kind of moving backwards. Mm-hmm. And this situation is starting from those fertilized cells at the very beginning of development and moving forward. So somewhere in the middle, maybe the two technologies will mm-hmm. merge. Yeah. Um, so this is the other thing I'm wondering about this. Is this something that you could use to develop an extinct species embryo because in, Probably. you know generally yep. you find a good vessel right so mm-hmm. you're like if i want to make and a it, mammoth i'm gonna put this this mammoth embryo in an we, elephant and we definitely do want to make a mammoth. and in this case the vessel is a <clears throat> jar <laughs> right. But if it was a mammoth, it'd be like a really big jar. Well, not at first. It would just have to be transferred Eventually. to become su- be like a success- success- successively larger jars yeah. and then a lamb bag and then a mammoth bag. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. So it's pretty interesting. This could potentially be a, a direction for... Um, also for in, v- in vitro fertilization for the uh, to really make sure that the development of embryos is progressing in the way that you want it to progress before implantation, before actually transferring them to a mother's womb. Um, you know, there are a lot of different reasons this could be very interesting. Uh, I mean, at, in the sci-fi take on this at some point like you brought up the lamb bag and there's this at some point it will lead to uh, embryos being taken to full development in some way I'm, uh, for sure Neat. for sure <laughs> we'll go there oh, um, oh no, no no can can you imagine <clears throat> if this technology was available this moment yeah uh, yeah, I want to have kids, but I don't want to get pregnant and go through all that nonsense. So I'll just hire this lab. Right. <laughs> I'll pick like, up my baby when they say it's ready. <laughs> yeah. And I then you wonder, like, all of the language and the heartbeat and that yeah. connection stuff. Maybe it turns out doesn't matter at all. Never mattered, actually. Just people like to think it mattered. Didn't matter at all. Could be. Or it could be very important and we just had no idea how or or you carry your jar of baby around with you like the sack of flour (laughs) in high school no (laughs) no (laughs) make sure you to make sure to shake your baby once a day (laughs) never shake a baby talk to your baby in a jar the the more you know don't shake baby tell that jar baby you love it (laughs) oh my god how is it in there little baby (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, and additionally, like uh, tie on to this Child, news. Child's first words: Never knock on the glass. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Don't ever do that again. Uh, uh, and a, a kind of carry on to this is another study that was also, uh, or a couple of studies that were published in Nature this week, and there were some preprints in this vein as well, related to the study of human fertility. It's been very difficult to, to, there are limits on studying human blastocysts, on studying human cells for ethical reasons. And there have been choices made and regulations taken so that the study of human cellular development is limited in many places around the world. However, researchers at the University of South Texas South of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, they have uh, taken skin cells and they were able to get them to become embryonic stem cells and then uh, pretty much get them with chemicals to turn into blastocysts, which are the first stage of a organs a organism's development. There's fertilization, fertilization. The egg then begins dividing, and then you get a little tiny ball of cells that's the blastocyst. After the blastocyst, you have this invagination that turns into the gastrula, which is that ball of cells that has, it's like a donut, basically. But the, 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 
what they're doing, they've created these human blastoids, basically these balls of cells that are able to grow in dishes in the lab that did right. not come right. from right. fertilized egg. Right. So, they so didn't that, come from that. They came no. backwards. It was like, no, here's but, my skin, and now we'll make some things that are very close to what the is developmental process is. That basically a cloning technique then? Kind of, yeah. I mean, the question is, they have the potential. Does it become viable? Did that you... is the question. I, yeah, could could that is could it work that way? I mean, we've got blastocysts. If you then put them into Good. the mouse jar, the baby jar, right, can you get them to grow? And then to the stage of the lamb bag, can we get that to work? I don't know. Um, and then, and then. Uh... <laughs> You're like, I think this this person has been very intelligent, very successful in their life. Hey, can I shake hands with you? Thank you. Swaps up. What are you doing? Oh, nothing. Just want to have successful offspring. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, the researchers the researchers state very carefully that these blastoids are not embryos, so they are not they are. They're not going to undergo those early stages of embryogenesis. I mean, but number one, they're, they're not getting growing. the right. They're not getting the right molecular sig signals. They don't have the right conversations going on at okay. the chemical, the chemical molecular level. But um, they're growing. But they are growing. They're cells that are growing <laughs> together. Are yeah. Um, what are they growing up to be? Yeah, but all countries, a but? pretty a, a bunch of countries, have decided one. that uh, that Jeez. blastoids, human blastoids, cannot be allowed to grow for more than fourteen days. Because after 14 days, the question of their viability as a uh, a developing human, <laughs> I think, becomes more questionable. But how else are we going to know if it could? <laughs> nah. So, so it's it's annoying. Uh, yes, there does need to be a cutoff. I think at some point we will all agree. But is it should it be 14 days? That seems uh, early. But yeah. then the argument can go on forever there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, though these blastoids that are being developed right now, no, they're not going to turn into embryos. They're not going to be able to turn into babies. But this is the kind of technology that leads us in the understanding that will allow this kind of stuff to happen in the future. So this, these studies that are out today are steps in the path of, um, of technologies related to um, in vitro fertilization, understanding uh, issues with fertility, of being able to um, foster children outside of a womb, um, given if there are medical conditions that won't allow you to have your own child. There are all sorts of things that um, there are use cases and the technologies are developing. It's very interesting to me. Stephen Rain in the chat room is asking, could DNA be copyrighted? It is all the time. Sequences yeah. of DNA are copyrighted all the time and, and given uh, patent protection. But uh, the, the way that it's understood and, right now by patent law yeah. is that you can't patent, patent a person's DNA or an individual's DNA. Yes. That is because that's nature. It's just something that was created by nature. Um, but if you synthetically create a sequence, like if you decide you're going to use DNA to store data and you create a data sequence within a certain DNA structure, then that you can patent right. that, or, or, like, well, or they, copyright. They, they, this, this is biotech all the time. They're constantly yeah. patenting uh, adjustments they make to a wild type strain. Yeah. And then that uh, augmented strain is specifically is... Uh, then, then copyrighted or patented, I suppose. Uh, and and can methodologies are usually copyrighted. I mean, methodologies are usually patented, and the uh, the sequences maybe are copyrighted. Copyright, I feel like, is publishing versus mm -hmm. using something. I don't know. Yeah, it is publishing. But also, those patent. those um, sequencing services that you can get for your own DNA, mm -hmm. you. Don't you sign off a bunch of rights to your sequences to them when you do that? Uh, no, you just no. allow them to do uh, research on them and utilize them anonymously, basically. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. 
it's because there's a, a ton of protections on people's medical files and that's part of your medical file and understanding technically and so they need to get special permission to be able to even research what you're offering them to, to mm -hmm. research um, hmm. but it comes with various levels of uh, not being able to connect you to it so they have to uh, separate you and keep you separate from that information uh, but then they can also share it uh, within a limited scope as well, beyond that, with other people who are doing research or other companies who are doing research in that same vein. All right, Justin, tell me about a shipwreck. All right, okay, whoa, 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 wait, wait, you're getting ahead of the story. Ah, you told us, okay. <laughs> Who's the headline? Oh, yeah, that's right. Hoist your sails when the winds are fair and the seas are smooth, but never mistake smooth sailing for skilled sailors because bigger ships with better crews than the one you are in have sunk beneath these waters. And on one such shipwreck, lost to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea nearly 2,000 years ago, discovered by sponge divers 120 years ago near the Greek island of Antikythera, was a strange lump of corroded bronze and wood that upon closer inspection had a gear of some sort embedded in it. Mystery gear turned out to be part of a larger mechanism, which eventually revealed it operated as a mechanical clockwork calendar with 30 gears and many inscribed discs and even some tiny beads that played a role somehow. It had the 12 zodiac symbols, Greek uh, writing, the Egyptian calendar, days of the year, they were kind of interesting. We were talking about like uh, they had uh, 12 30 day months and then five days that you just you did, you got through and you forgot they even existed. You just did those five days. But the rest of the months were all the same. Sounds like uh, a five day vacation for everybody. It kind of, it kind of was <laughs> like, this, is, this time doesn't count, but we got to do it. Uh, if your birthday was on this day, sorry, you, you don't exist. <laughs> Researchers at the University of College London have discovered that it could do even more. Uh, so it, they found that it can show the ancient Greek order of the universe, which is basically what we call the solar system today. The planets, I think they uh, had five planets at that time. This is quoting the lead author, Professor Tony Freeth of the University College London Mechanical Engineering, explaining, uh, ours is the first model that confirms to all the physical evidence, uh, confirms to, conforms to all the physical evidence and matches the descriptions of the scientific inscriptions engraved in the mechanism itself. The sun, moon, and planets are displayed in an impressive tour de force of ancient Greek brilliance. So they kind of worked somewhat off of some past studies. 2005, there was 3D x-rays and surface imaging enabled them to show how the mechanism uh, predicted the eclipses and it calculated the variable motion of the moon and it uncovered too that there was thousands of uh, text thousands of, of icons of text within the mechanism uh, let's see so about a third of the mechanism has actually survived so they're missing most of it and that was split into 82 fragments so there was a big puzzle to put together in the first place biggest surviving fragment is known as fragment a it displays those features bearing pillars and a block. Another is uh, fragment D, which has featured an uh, hereto unexplained 63 tooth gear and plate. This is pretty, pretty complicated mechanism. Uh, yeah, they found thousands of text characters hidden inside the fragments when they did the x-ray stuff. Uh, they found planets moving on rings and indicated by marker beads. And it was uh, this that the team was trying to reconstruct. And one of the things that the x-rays showed from the front cover was uh, something that said 462 years and another that said 442 years. Sort of interesting because that happens to accurately represent the cycles of Venus and Saturn respectively. They, uh, they actually had calculated the, tr the motions of Venus and Saturn. When, ob uh, when observed from Earth, the planets have uh, cycles that kind of reverse themselves. They didn't quite have it like an elliptical. It would like go way over here and it's going to move back again at some point. Uh, so they had to track all these variables over these long periods of time to be able to predict their, their positions. And they did that through the mechanism. 
So they still didn't figure. They, okay, so this is quoting voice uh, from member Eris Dickinalis of the research team. The classic astronomy of the first millennium BC originated in Babylon, but nothing in this astronomy suggested how the Greeks found the highly accurate 462-year cycle for Venus and 442-year cycle for Saturn. So using some ancient Greek mathematical methods that they had found that were had been described by the philosopher per, uh, Permenides, the team not only could explain how the cycles for Venus and Saturn were derived using that, that ancient math, but also managed to recover the cycles of all the other planets that were missing and then be able to find them in the mechanism. In fact, after, this is uh, David Higgin, who's a PhD candidate, member of the team. After considerable struggle, we managed to match the evidence in fragments A and D to a mechanism for Venus, and as well, uh, that, that's completely related to uh, that 63-tooth gear that was playing <laughs> a crucial role. Team then created innovative mechanisms for all of the planets that would calculate the new advanced astronomical cycles and minimize the number of gears in the whole system so that they could fit it into these tight spaces. They still have to go back and, and they still haven't figured out how to truly fully reconstruct this thing, partly because there's a bunch of things missing. But there's also these little tubes inside and these beads will apparently, from the way it sounds, the beads will sort of drop and show like, oh, this planet is now going to be here. And we should look for this one here at certain occasions. So it's insanely complicated mechanism, 2,000 years old. Uh, a One of the first... Uh, oh, uh, wait, the surprise part of this. Somebody's asking, wait, wait, until, wait till Justin gets to the surprise part of this. I thought that was the surprise. That's the <laughs> surprise. They could, they, could, uh, they could calculate the planets with it. So they were they had a calendar that was not just a calendar but a solar like a solar system not a solar it, calendar but a solar system calendar solar system calendar and yeah. and maybe this is the surprise part and could also tell you when the next Olympics was about to happen <laughs> of course because yeah, you need to be there all, to start running the at the right time yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gotta get there at the right time. So did they think that this was a common device or was this something that was like a specialty item that only certain people, like, was a one-off? So it's, it's a one-off as far as history is concerned. We've yeah, as far never as history seen anything concerned. like that. Yeah. Okay. For, as far as our, I mean, even a description of this is missing. Um, the question but, is, did the person who had it, did everyone think that they were crazy? <laughs> so it was in the I'm shipwreck. They tell. think it might have been looted. From somewhere and was being transferred. It was on a Roman ship. Uh, it's got Greek lettering and it's tracking Greek stuff. It's Egyptian uh, calendar, but it's a Greek thing heading to Rome. It may have been looted from uh, a military campaign. They don't. Th the thing is, we just don't know. We just don't know. There's been nothing else like it or hinting at it ever. I just picture someone saying, I know where the planets will be. And everyone's like, yeah, all right, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> there it's, he goes again. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Put so your actually, weird I, box away. <laughs> I say that there's been nothing like it found, and that's pretty much true. But there have been accounts of other mechanized sort of robotic animatronic devices yeah, and things that, that have go been way back. About that, but have not been found. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, that's just storytelling. Then you find a thing like this and go, wow, they had a very complicated understanding. Somebody did of, of clockwork gearing uh, 2000, 2000 years ago. That's what impresses me is the uh, the number of gears, the complexity of the sizes gears. of gears, the way they interlock with each other, the way they move together. I mean, that in itself is mind boggling to consider the complexity of how they all work together. But I'm not a clockmaker. I've never tried. I, you know, I could probably yeah. deal with a couple of gears, but you start putting more together and it, it raises the levels of complexity. How big was this thing, Justin? Uh, oh, that's a good question. There it is. Is that, uh, no, that's not. Is that centimeters that it's showing there? Oh, no. the no, centimeters for some of the gears. Oh, yeah, like 10 Individual gears. Yeah. 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 
Huh. Which, you know, when you think of making those gears. That's inside the that larger that's... mechanism. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. This thing has been, we've been talking about this mechanism, the Antikythera mechanism, this mystery for <laughs> decades. People have been yeah. looking into this, trying to, f what is it? What secrets of the universe does it hold? It's pretty awesome with modern technology and some puzzle solvers, pretty much. These mm -hmm. scientists who've been working so hard to figure out how it all pieced together and figure yeah. out the puzzle. And there's still yeah. thousands of icons that we haven't really figured out how they play in. I mean, this is yeah. also part of the incredible nature of it. It's like, what if it does something else? You know? This is this is amazing so far. Yeah. It's pretty <laughs> it's cool, right? Yeah. All right, Blair, you have a story mm -hmm. for us? Yes, about masks. Are you so, going to bad mouth the masks? I I am and I am I'm not. So, <laughs> so of course at the be the beginning of the pandemic we were saying don't wear masks, save them for the m medical heroes. And then we said wear them to protect everyone else. And now it turns out all along they were protecting us too, right? So they're very essential to our safely getting to the other side of this pandemic. And I am not going to say anything to the contrary because masks are essential to that. But let me ask you this. What is a surgical mask made out of? Do either of you know? Have you thought about it? Plastic fibers. Mm -hmm. It's not made of nice cotton, is it? No, it's not cotton. It's not paper. Mm -hmm. It's plastic. These disposable face masks are made from plastic microfibers. And you can see where this is going. It's an ecological nightmare. So <laughs> this, is, this is a problem because, of course, right now, we are throwing away around 129 billion face masks every month. That's 3 million a minute. But even after the pandemic is over, these are needed for the medical field. So mm -hmm. it's not like it just, it goes away overnight, right? Disposable masks are here to stay. And this is a big problem with the medical field in general, right? There's a lot of disposable things. There's things you can't use over and over. There's things that you can't sterilize. There's things that it's safer for everyone if you have a disposable product. Mm -hmm. But when you look at these disposable masks that are made out of plastic, it can't be biodegraded, but it does break up into small plastic par particles. They're micro and nanoplastics, and they are already widespread in ecosystems there's no official guidance on mask recycling. Plastic bottles, for example, you can recycle, but you can't do that with masks right now. So they are disposed of as solid waste. Even the ones that make it into the trash, which we know it's been a huge problem of people for yeah. some reason, just taking the mask off and throwing it on the ground. I don't understand what's going on there. <laughs> but like ultimately, all the other things. Even yeah. if you're putting it in the garbage, a huge amount of it will end up in the water column anyway. And so these uh, masks that are made out of micro-sized plastic fibers, they have a thickness of about 1 to 10 micrometers. When they break down in the environment, they release more micro-sized plastics that are easier and faster uh, than bulk plastics like plastic bags to, to move around and get digested and all sorts of other things. There's actually a new generation of disposable masks coming out called nano masks. You might think that might be better. Ooh, no, made out of nano-sized plastic fibers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even uh, smaller. Yeah, the diameter <laughs> is smaller than one micrometer. And uh, they also are probably going to be a new source of nanoplastic pollution. Um, so the, the other problem is, I didn't even think about this. They have buildup of harmful chemicals if you're wearing them to, to work with chemicals. They have buildup of biological substances like bisphenol A. They have heavy metals in them. And if you're using it to filter out microorganisms like pathogens, then those end up in the water column. So that's all part of this kind of problematic situation with the masks. So what can you do? The, the researchers who, who are kind of looking into this, there's no official research yet on the microplastic, kind of the depth and breadth of the microplastics from uh, disposable masks yet, that's in process. But um, the people who are looking into this have four suggestions for disposable masks. One, set up mask only trash cans for collection and disposal. Makes sense, then they're not gonna fly out of your kitchen trash, right? Yeah. Two, 
consider standardization guidelines and strict implementation of waste management for mask waste. So that could that could be a way to maybe recycle them or find a way to seclude this stuff in a safer space. Three, replace disposable masks with reusable face masks whenever possible, like cotton masks, which a lot of us are doing, but that needs to be kind of pushed forward whenever possible. And if and you're using the cotton masks, make sure that you're double masking because that's why they say double mask now. It's not that oh, you're wearing an N95, double mask with N95s. No, it's just yeah. put a couple of cloth masks on to really make the uh, the filtration better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the fourth suggestion here is to, of course, consider development of biodegradable disposable masks. Mm -hmm. It's got to be out there. There has to be a possibility for this. So that's the actually the main reason I brought this story is that a lot of people probably thought their surgical mask was made out of cotton or paper, mm -hmm. and it's not. It's made out of plastic. And somebody might have a really great idea for how to make a biodegradable mask made out of potato or corn. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Well, I mean, a lot of plastic does come from biological sources. We do have plastics that come from potato, from soybeans, from, you know, Bamboo floors, bamboo polyester comes from bamboo, you know, so natural, there are natural sources to the plastic fibers. It's just that they are a certain conformation of molecules that leads to the way that they work within the environment and how they don't break down as easily. Um, I'm thinking, though, the thing that they're missing here is using plastic eating bacteria. Like, we should get some kind of, you get your, your plastic eating by, by bacteria glop and you slop it into your bag of disposed, disposed of face masks and then throw the whole thing away. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, when there's a global pandemic on, maybe you mm -hmm. have your, your mask bin and uh, you put out mask waste once a month yeah. and your your waste management company picks that up, and that goes into a giant plastic-eating glop. At yeah, their it would facility. be hazardous. It would be, quote, kind of hazardous waste disposal at that point, depending on, you know, you don't know what has been breathed where or how, yeah. and so that would be a an interesting, <clears throat> but, yeah, but a waste disposal company could deal with that, but, so, yeah, simple so, to compost. Uh, medical medical mm -hmm. and labs do that already. They have, you know, they have... Uh, biological hazard bins that stuff goes into the, the yeah. specific uh, crew comes and collects and yeah. takes away again. What they do with it, I don't know. Probably maybe it just goes to the dump, but they at least yeah. transport it. It goes I to mean, a special dump. Yes. A magical special lab and medical dump. I like the idea of, near. you know, you've got near your big grocery stores, sometimes you have like the, the bottle drop and you've got the, the plastic recycling and you can go take things and you've also got your face mask disposal it is everything yeah. in the same place i mean i wear disposable contact lenses and so i yeah. collect all of the contact lens cases and the contact lenses themselves i have a special little disposal for them and those get dropped off at my uh, optician and and she sends it back to the company and and some of it gets recycled and and it's it it prevents those little tiny microplastics that are in disposable contact lenses from ending up just in normal trash in and in the water column. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, how do you prevent cancerous cells from spreading? Um, why don't you tell me? Yeah. <laughs> Counter to some, I don't know, woo conspiracy theory ideas that you might hear out there. Um, some researchers at Ohio State have discovered that electromagnetic fields could slow or stop certain kinds of cancers. When cancerous cells were exposed to electromagnetic fields in the laboratory, they found that it inhibited the cell's cancer cells metabolism, did not inhibit normal cells, but it stopped cancerous cells from expanding and traveling and growing in the way that cancerous cells like to grow and develop. The researchers uh, think that it selectively works by changing the electrical fields inside 
these cells uh, that somehow accesses the internal workings of the cell. Um, but this is something that is a kind of new discovery based on their work. And so they have more work to do for sure. It started okay. more questions. Okay. So <laughs> one of the things about cancerous cells is they have stopped listening to all the neighboring cells. They've stopped listening to the orders to stop growing. They've stopped yeah. listening to the apoptosis orders. They stopped listening to anything other than we're in go mode. Sh we're in shut all the, cut all the communication to the outside world. We're just going to grow. Go. Yeah. So some sort of disruptive, you might call it, com uh, information comes through from this magnetic field. <laughs> Gets yeah. through. A normal cell, it's like, okay, what's that? That's noise. Because we're on Don't communication. Need it. That's noise. Don't need it. It gets into that cancer cell, and the cancer cell is like, oh, wait, we got a signal that we have orders. We have new orders. Do something. Wait, we just got to figure out what it is. Like, something finally gets through. So there's a way that that kind of, like, just makes sense makes to you sense in a way. That it could be. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But it does also make me laugh because then all these people who are trying to get away from like high power lines and like being afraid this, of the meter on the yes. side of the house because yes. that causes cancer. Actually, just like just like when they took the mercury out of the vaccines and the autism rates went up, apparently autism was preventing autism. That's not how that works. But the, you, you're making it up pseudoscience health fear remedy junk is actually killing you. Yeah, no, I, I act I was <laughs> I, I I was thinking about this, you know, it's like all these people who are upset about the electromagnetic fields around high power lines, about cell phones, about all these things, and it's like wow, if this study has something to do with that and I, I this to me this is a very interesting um <laughs> opposite <Yeah. laughs> completely counter to what they're positing kind of result so uh the Uzi, yeah. the ice man how old is Uzi the ice man is he a three thousand year old or, uh, or i don't remember yeah three to anyway, five yeah. yeah uh high cholesterol yeah <laughs> <laughs> he had nothing has nothing to do with the modern diet he it was like a 40 year old man with high cholesterol it was even normal then yeah that was that's just how humans have been for a long time yep i just didn't have a uh, word for it <laughs> all right anyway i kind of feel like maybe if this work goes further we'll keep an eye on it and see how these electromagnetic fields end up actually tying into why they affect cancer cells in this way but um i don't know maybe there's going to people be using electromagnetic fields as like a cancer force field Oh, they're going to be using that way ahead of any research or development. <laughs> this is the problem with information. Like, sometimes it's just better. A we little bit is too like, much. Shh. We, we just found this thing, but we're going to be really quiet about it until we can get Actually, more causation involved. Yeah. Somebody's going to totally misinterpret it and start kicking around a microwave. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> What's that? I'm just wearing my uh, magnet shirt. It's just full of magnets. Uh... But I apparently got a, I I went to go <laughs> get in the car. Uh, I think I have too strong of magnets. I couldn't. I got up to the door and now stuck. I'm stuck. Here. <laughs> um, how do you turn off a magnet? That's really kind of difficult. All right, tell me about some bad uh, air. Okay, so the Roman word for air is uh, area. The word for bad was mal. Put them together and you get area mal which is full of suspect error that might be bad these days. Put them together the other way around and you get malaria. Romans believed that bad air of some regions were responsible for the disease that they called malaria. Long thought to be a disease first encountered during the birth of human agriculture when we started grouping together and irrigating and then being around standing water, there would be mosquitoes. We think this is how malaria first uh, started to interact with humans. But now new bioarchaeological research shows that malaria has threatened human communities for more than 7,000 years. This is uh, lead author Dr. Melandri Vlok, Department of An uh, Anatomy, University of Otago, says this groundbreaking research published in Scientific Reports changes our understanding of how long humans have been dealing with malaria which, by the way, still one of the deadliest uh, diseases in the world. 
2019 World Health Organization estimated 229 million cases of malaria around the world. And it, uh, if you get malaria and you die from it, most of the time you are under the age of five years old. This is a very brutal, lethal uh, ailment. Uh, research has identified thalassemia, which is a thing that you can get. Um, it's a it's a genetic disorder that causes porous bones. It can have some very devastating effects. However, for some reason, it also offers, in the milder form, some protection against malaria. Researchers identified thalassemia in an ancient hunter-gatherer archaeological site from Vietnam dated to approximately 7,000 years ago. This is thousands of years before we had the green acres farming stuff going on anywhere. Uh, and in this particular region, mosquitoes are common in the forest. So you don't have to have that irrigation uh, pools of standing water scenario for the, that, that, lar that high degree of mosquito and human interaction. It was pre they're, they're present there in the forests. So it's pretty interesting. They had uh, used microscopic techniques to investigate ch changes in bone tissue to identify the disease. Uh, they had found it in a 7,000-year-old hunter-gatherer site, and then they found it again in a 4,000-year-old agricultural site in the same region. So then you have two examples uh, separated by 3,000 years. This is Dr. Vloke, Cody voice. A lot of pieces came together. Then there was a startling moment of realization that malaria was present and problematic for these people all those years ago and a lot earlier than we've known about until now. So just a little bit of advice from the past, right. uh, 7,000 years ago. Diseases have a way of sticking around. <laughs> well, and so, you know, you were talking about how devastating this disease is, but that it kind of... How do I put this the right way? It's like when we've talked about on the show how uh, an effective pathogen doesn't have a 100% death rate. Because <laughs> it right. has to stick around, right? Yeah. And yeah, so you yeah. can see how if malaria is stuck with us for this long, it's done in its view, a really good job of being deadly enough, but not too deadly within our population. And that might be why it's stuck around so effectively for so long. And and it's still like, and it doesn't affect everybody as badly. And I guess if you have access to medical, it's not a big deal. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a, f a friend of mine from back in the day, uh, who's a, f a physicist from India, uh, told me he'd gotten malaria like a number of times. Like, like I've had, he was like, oh, malaria. Yeah, I've had that many times. <laughs> like, I grew up with what? it. Yeah, yeah, it was just common in the region he grew up in that Jeez. people got malaria. That's just the thing that happened. It's like the seasonal malaria came along. You know, seasonal flu here, seasonal malaria there. Yeah, it's like, oh, Joey's <laughs> not in school today. Oh, yeah, he has malaria. <laughs> like, oh, God. <laughs> We know that a lot of diseases, a lot of viruses, a lot of parasites have stuck with us for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, there's been research into the herpes virus, which goes back as long as humanity has been around and even further. Like, it's been like there are diseases that have evolved with us that stick with us. There are ideas that previous COVID viruses that are now common flus caused major pandemics in the past and then they eventually lots of people died and then turned into a common cold because herd immunity and the uh, and also possibly changes in the virus enough to make coexistence possible um yeah so malaria is another one been around it's been at around. least at least seven thousand years at, at least. least probably longer uh, probably much longer mm -hmm. yeah yep because uh, yeah because southeast asia it's, it's a pretty early uh one of the uh, one of the earlier sites that humans uh, yep. reached 
Uh, for that. And then there was Denise Evans were already there. Mm-hmm. Maybe so. Like, did they have malaria issues? Like, how how far back does this? Why not? <laughs> were there mosquitoes? Were there biting? Like, were there biting insects? Were there human-like <laughs> organisms? Yes, yes, most likely. Okay, um, Blair, mm. what's a giraffe's blood pressure like? Well, it has to be. That's kind of a funny question. So it has to be really high because it has to pump it up to its head, which is why giraffes don't lay their head down for very long ever. It's because they'll get just the worst head rush. <laughs> so this giant, powerful heart. And if they put their head below their heart, they can black out. Yeah, it's like the they're, they're, I guess, equivalent of standing with their knees locked. Right, all the yeah. the blood stays in their head. What happened? Oh, I uh, kneeled down too quick. <laughs> well, researchers decided to dig a little deeper into the gir- giraffe genome to find out more about the genes that allow the great blood pressure and height and behavioral adaptations of giraffes to take place. So they um, they looked very deeply at the chromosome level giraffe genome and compared it with other ruminant genomes. They looked at a bunch of giraffe spe- specific mutations and found a lot of mutations in a gene called FGFR F R L FGFRL one FGFRL one, and this is a gene related to blood pressure. So what did the researchers do? They used CRISPR to put the giraffe gene into mice to see what happened to the mouse ability to deal with high blood pressure when they had the giraffe genes. So basically, they took giraffe genes, put them into mice, and then gave the mice high blood pressure and checked to see what happens. And the mice were like, dude, high high blood pressure? That's fine. I can totally deal. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) yes so these mutations not just the giant heart of the giraffe but also genetic mutations have allowed giraffes to actually manage constant high blood pressure and we might be able to use their mutations our understanding of how those mutations work to help human high blood pressure maybe we can find genomic level treatments for people who are very hot, have very high blood pressure at some point. I mean, or maybe there are targeted treatments that can be targeted at certain receptors based on what we understand about this um, at some point. I just pictured, I, yeah, I, I got a pig heart valve and giraffe genes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I immediately pictured Human uh, zoo. Uh, a comp- picture of conference. It's maybe... 50,000, 100,000 years into the future, maybe longer. It's a conference. And as the lights go up at the conference, you realize that somebody's at the podium about to speak, and it's all mice. And the mouse is announcing, we have discovered the cure to high blood pressure from ancient ancient ape texts that we have deciphered, (laughs) curing yet another disease that has malefected mice kind. For so long. <laughs> yeah, eventually, we'll all just have immortal mice, right? Is that the deal? Yeah, just like, I, just, I mean, like these ancient apes, they spent so much time curing all of mouse kind's diseases. And I'll giving them, much. And giving them to, to, yeah. to giving to diseases to mice. Oh, my goodness. Um, another thing that they found is that uh, the researchers found genetically edited mice did not have uh, yeah, so they didn't have this normal reaction to this a compound Ang2, which is an angiotensin, high blood pressure related uh, gene. They uh, additionally noted a sensory trade off in giraffes. So the genes of their sense of smell were reduced and downgraded, and uh, vision genes were upgraded. So there's more more stuff going on in giraffe vision than there is in giraffe smell. And the researchers hypothesize that this is because giraffes rely on horizon scanning vision 
from the tall vantage point, and that olfaction at five meters from the ground probably isn't as important as it might be for other animals. (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, and they're not they're not working too hard to sniff out food. It's I don't think yeah. acacia smells too much. <laughs> Just <Yeah>. leaves. <laughs> yeah, if you think about how they forage and what they're doing, yeah. right? Oh, I see some over there, Bob, as opposed to I smell the wafting of yeah. acacia leaves on the breeze. Mm-hmm. Yes, no. Um but anyway, yeah, big discoveries thanks to giraffes could help high blood pressure. Giraffes and mice, giraffe mouse combos. Anyway, Justin, did you have another story you want to talk about right now? Oh, I did. I have a, a really fast story. This is the, the cool. quick, 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 quick story. Researchers in Australia have found that for each new fast food outlet in a region, the number of heart attacks per 100,000 people goes up by four. Team found that the fast food was positively correlated with an increase of mitochondrial infraction, even after accounting for other factors such as age, obesity, uh, high cholesterol, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, socioeconomic status, all of these things were factored in. And while co- correlation isn't causation, it is a tool used to discover causation. Absolutely, it is. It's a, a, it's a step in here. the direction of discovery. Look over here. What? 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 What's happening to you two? What am I? Looking for? <laughs> I'm trying to see what Kiki's looking Is at. Is there something I... on my face? What are you guys doing? I can't see it from here. I don't know. <laughs> he told me to look over here, and so I was like, "What?" Oh, I was doing this. Is there spinach well, in like... my teeth? A little bit, a little bit, right now. <laughs> But that's the uh, fast story of the week. You know fast what that food. is? That's the French fry factor. <laughs> you think it's you blaming the French fries straight off? Oh, okay. I am. Might I'm gonna be. blame the French fries. French fry factor. <laughs> At least I'm not gonna blame them. I'm just coining the term right now. Okay, you heard it here first. This is This Week in Science. If you just tuned in, we're talking about all the science from the week. Are you enjoying the show? Please tell a friend. This week in science. Okay, I'm going to come right back. And hey, can we have a little bit of a COVID update? Yeah, I think it's time. It's been a bit. Okay, let's have a bit of a COVID update. COVID, COVID, COVID update. Wee! Okay, in vaccine news, AstraZeneca, that is a... The Oxford vaccine, which has not yet been approved here in the United States, although it is under review, has been put on hold in several Mm. countries after reports of blood clots following administration. Many of the reports, uh, there are conflicting reports in that some reports say that the numbers of blood clots are not more than would be found in the average population population without the vaccine right. and others say that the numbers of blood clots are in are higher than would be found on average and are within a certain time frame a short time frame after getting the vaccine and so are indicative of a cause however it's still contested there's a review that definitely has to take place um, but in many places they're talking about potentially just stopping the use of certain batches with the question of whether certain batches, because the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine is manufactured in multiple plants in many different places, that certain batches could be could be bad um, or having these effects for some reason. There could be differences in how they're being manufactured. There's a lot of questions at the moment, um, but to put it in perspective, the numbers of blood clot effects are still much, 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 much less than what you would actually expect your chances of getting the virus to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's is- what I was trying to find. I want to say it yeah. was like, it's this can't be right. But I thought I thought it had, it was like really 40 low. people. Out of like um, 50 million yeah. <laughs> vaccinations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, so, yeah. So it's that's... A, mm. <laughs> yeah, so the numbers... It, it, the, if you remember, there was a brief 
pause on the uh, the Pfizer vaccine when it first was let out um, and because in the UK because of the question of allergic reactions. And now we know there are some people who do have allergic reactions. And so there's a period of like, OK, let's watch you to make sure you don't have an allergic reaction and let's keep an eye on that. Um, and that's taken into consideration. But um, there even though it's not happening to a lot of people, this is part of the process. You want to keep an eye on it and mm-hmm. stop something before it does become a lot of people. Uh, we don't want any of these treatments to become worse than the right. actual disease. Well, and, and um, you would hope that out of these 40 people or whatever it is, it's such a small number, it'd be hard to even point to anything specific. But if there was something in common with these people, yeah. like a, um, for example, we were just talking about cholesterol, like maybe yeah. high cholesterol had is something to do something? with it or something yeah. like that, then you could select for that and say, maybe you're not a good candidate for this vaccine. Right. And we don't know that yet. So right. perhaps that will become that will become understood and that news will be passed along at some point. Yeah. Um, but I'm, in that in that I'm as still, well, the AstraZeneca the- vaccine is also not working <laughs> against oh. the B351 variant of COVID-19, yes. which is the South African variant, which is a, a special vaccine escape concern. Um, Yeah, so apparently a new paper out in New England Journal of Medicine, AstraZeneca, it doesn't work (laughs) against that particular variant. So if you get the if you get the AstraZeneca vaccination, there's a limit to how much it may protect you against future variants. And you may be in the next few months, year, looking at definitely getting a booster shot of something, something else. What were you going to say, Justin? Yeah. Oh, well, so the, one of the confounding elements of, of this, uh, and I get it's been, you know, great minds are at work uh, trying to sort this out right now. Yeah. But one of the interesting things is uh, there was a correlation of people who had gotten COVID and survived it who then had strokes. Uh, yeah. So, so... I think part of it is just we're looking at very large populations and all of this. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, it it's so hard to, to separate the noise. Uh, From a signal. And, yeah. Yeah. Except mm-hmm. that uh, sp- I guess it was specifically like not linked to high cholesterol and this sort of thing. So these yeah. were these were outliers, which is why it got the attention that it, that it right. has garnered at this point. Yeah. Um, and then speaking of variants, the UK variant B117, new research dun, 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 says that B117 is up to, is not only more transmissible, but up to 68% deadlier now with 68% more death um, as compared to other circulating COVID variants. Um, But the good news with B117 is that as far as we are aware, based on current testing, it does appear to be neutralized. There's a slight reduction in neutralization effectiveness, but it does appear to be neutralized by most of the vaccines that we are currently administrating. So that's good. So there's a couple things I want to point out about this that I think is really important is uh, for somebody just kind of reading this headline, they could see 68% deadlier and turn that into 68% deadly in their head. And that is very different. Very different. Very different. Because it's 68% deadlier than the virus that we've been tracking that's like 1.7% or something like that. So it's, it's, it's higher but it's still a very it's a smaller number so i don't i don't want people totally panicking over the variant but but the other thing i really want to point out is this is exactly this is one of the reasons why even if you got a vaccine you're still supposed to be wearing a mask when you go out in public and it's yeah. it this is exactly why is that yes the vaccines still cover by and large the variants however the only way for us to get past these deadlier variants is to reduce spread. Mm-hmm. And the way to do that is, is by masking, even if you've been vaccinated, because you might be carrying that deadlier strain. And so being able to 
prevent that from happening is really important. And one of the things that is being talked about more and more, and we've brought it up on the show here, is the difference between a vaccine that is prophylactic in treating the disease versus treating transmission transmissibility. Mm -hmm. And so far, what we know is that these vaccines are fantastic at preventing disease. And so, like you've said, asymptomatic transmission can occur. However, there are uh, researchers looking at viral loads in nasal swabs of people who have been vaccinated, trying to figure out how many people are infected and in, ca- in, in fact able to spread the disease, spread the virus, even though they're not showing disease. And so a new study just came out looking at the mRNA viruses, looking at people who were vaccinated, and it's a broad swath of people. They looked at thousands of people to see whether or not they had uh, were capable of or whether they had asymptomatic infections after vaccination. And they found that the mRNA virus, the mRNA vaccines reduce asymptomatic infections by 80 percent after the second dose. Okay, that's it's not 100 percent. It's 80 percent. So that's still that's huge. great, but that's it, there's, fa- but there's still risk. Yeah, yeah and this is why the CDC said if you're around a bunch of other vaccinated people, you can hang out. Is because yeah, eighty percent and eighty percent and eighty percent and eighty percent. There's very pretty good risk. odds for you right there. But yeah, that's so- also why there's all these weird gray areas in the CDC's mm-hmm. thing that they said, which is like if there's one person who's not vaccinated from one household, then you're probably okay. But if there's two households of unvaccinated individuals, then you don't want to mix those because they're not protected. Then they can yeah. spread to each other. <laughs> there's it's it's unfortunately it's still very gray. And so there's still you still have it to be really gray. careful. A- absolutely. Yes. But it's still fantastic news because yes. the, the terrifying thing would be that everyone gets vaccinated and still carries and transmits and shares this virus. You're not getting the ill health effects now because everybody is vaccinated and this, you know, we're, we're, we're going forward maybe a year. I don't know how long this is going to take. Um, everybody's vaccinated, but the, the virus is now thriving in a population that doesn't die from it. Mm-hmm, and right. then a mutant finally comes along and we just jump right back into this again and none of the vaccines work. And one right. of the things about vaccines too is we've been talking about, there are still maybe a dozen or more vaccines that are being developed. The ones that we have now were emergency released. Yep. And their effectiveness is where it is and that's great. And so we should all do it now to prevent the spread. Uh, yep. But we may be also then, uh, again, a year, two years down the road, be getting vaccines that are 100% at everything. So we may, we may in this arms race against this virus, yeah. we are now uh, beginning to turn the tide and we'll just, I think, be doing better in the future. Although I don't like predicting things because I also was like, this is probably just going to go away like the flu um, in the very <laughs> beginning yeah. because it's novel. We don't know. It might just be. And I was really wrong then. So if I'm wrong again, as wrong now, oh, shoot. I should no, not but I predict think you're, things. I think, I think you're right on the fact that we are going to be dealing with some kind of vaccine for this virus for the foreseeable future. And even though you're getting vaccinated within the next six months with the emergency released vaccines, you know, within another six months to a year after that, be ready to probably get vaccinated again. There will be more vaccines released. You'll want to get uh, you'll probably want to get booster shots. There's uh, the reason and the way that this arms race is going to work is with that development of new vaccines. Moderna is already testing a new uh, a new target for for a new booster shot for their vaccine. Um, so they're they're the, the researchers are always already on this. They know there are variants. They know what's happening and they're trying to predict. They are trying to predict the future because they need to protect us in the future. Yeah. 
Anyway, it's, it's really, I mean, the, the evolution, viral evolution, the immunity and the way that it works at a population level is, I mean, this stuff is fascinating. And if somebody, I honestly, we're going to have more of these pandemics. If you're interested mm-hmm. in biology, immunology, virology, data, genomics, viral evolution, this is, I mean, also uh, computational uh, evolution, f- phylogenies. This stuff is going to be a big area of study in the future. I don't see this going away. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's going is... to be money put into these areas yeah. for sure. Well, and that's the other thing. There's money to be had by going into it because yes. for whatever reason, the patents for these vaccines are, are being held Except tight. John, is it Johnson & Johnson that's uh, done a... Is it a non-commercial or there's one of the vaccines that's uh that's well, that's they... like a non that's that's non-profit based um there are others that are definitely based uh profit based for sure um it's very each of them is different yeah but. so so in in a in a really tragic having to learn the hard way humans once again <laughs> humans. despite all of the warnings from science despite people saying this Despite the bird flu, the what was the the MERS, the swine flu, but besides all these near uh, events like this that we have managed to avoid, and then taking the eye off the ball and defunding the 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 observers in the field, defunding the research into all of this stuff that takes place, maybe it takes something like this to just okay now this is a thing we monitor and research constantly. And have that as a true pipeline of funding <laughs> to that research that does not get cut off or diminished yeah. because hey, we haven't had a problem for a few years. Oh, maybe hey, this is what hey, it's all like. you capitalists who yeah. like the economy, yeah. you don't want this to happen again, right? No. How about we try? <laughs> yeah. And I also I think it's worth mentioning as long as we're talking COVID on the show right now that mm-hmm. you know we just came a- across the the year anniversary of the shutdown for, yeah. for in the United States. Yeah, um, it has been a year. And we went past it. Just in the last week was my anniversary of being sent home from work. And um when it all started we were saying we can't wait for the vaccine. We can't wait for the vaccine. We have to figure this out. If we wait for the vaccine, 200,000 people will die. 535,000 yeah. people in the United States. Yeah, so, so important to recognize we thought we were being doomsday alarmists about it, trying to give this huge number, and it wasn't even half nope. of what it was before the vaccine came out. And we said we can't wait. We waited. It was more than twice what we thought. And so, yeah, I do think this is a really important reminder to to stay vigilant and not let it get here again. It's springtime. Uh, the schools are opening in my area. I know they've opened in lots of places. And, um, you know, it's springtime. I mean, luckily, outdoors is much safer than indoors. So I hope everybody in- safely enjoys the outdoors as we move into our nicer months in the northern hemisphere. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah, it it. It's still here. It's not gone yet, everyone. But let's keep moving. But you know what? We can have hope. I think that's the big thing. We can, we, we, we can be optimistic. It's going to still I, take time, but yeah. things will start getting better. They will. And I just, I just one last thing. I because you said uh, I can't remember who who it was said uh, cap. If you capitalists, if you like your businesses to be open, yeah. you need to fund this stuff. My my. Uh, begrudging fear is that what this will lead to is not increased taxes for funneling those funds to address the future version of this problem, but that they will do the capitalistic version of socialism, which they'll create like pandemic insurance for your business. Hmm. So you can pay a little extra in case there's a pandemic, you'll be made right and not have to pay taxes, which is a weird thing if you think about it, but that's how... So much of at least the American capitalist system operates is they will opt for insurance versus uh, a social protection. actually fixing something. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a, and so watch for watch for pandemic insurance watch it happen. to show up 
Let us know if you see it. <laughs> there's going to be, yeah. I mean, there's all, there's already a pandemic clause in my new wedding contract. So. <laughs> in sickness and in health, unless it's a pandemic, in which case I'm staying <laughs> far away from you as I can possibly no, get. No, that's a wedding license. That's different. I'm talking Not about wedding. Like venue. Venue oh, contract. Oh, 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 okay. oh, oh, oh. oh, my goodness. All right. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for listening to us right now. If you are enjoying the show, please consider heading to twist.org and clicking the Patreon link. Patreon is how we are funded by you, our listeners. You're our supporters. You're the ones who help us continue to do this show every single week. We take a few breaks here and there, but really we're here every week with you. And we love to talk about science with you. So can you hang out with us and help us out and help us keep it going? by supporting us on Patreon. Head over to twist.org and click that Patreon link. We really can't do this without you. Thank you for your support. All right, coming on back. It's that part of the show. Wait, what did you say, Blair? It's for the birds? Yeah. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. Want to hear about animals? She's your girl, except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? Oh, I have the very sad sort story of why it is tough to be a regent honey eater in Australia. So this is <laughs> this is a study looking at. Um, Regent, Regent honey eaters honey eater. over eater. over five years, tracking how they sing and how they learn their songs. Oh, it is In, a bird. Okay. Mm-hmm, it is a bird, the honey eater. And their songs are how they, they the males woo their females with their bird songs. Tale as old as time. And they usually learn those tunes from adult mentors. They leave the nest before they start singing when they're very young. So they learn their their bird song from other adults nearby, not their parents. And so over this tracking of singing ability and breeding success in the critically endangered Regent Honey Eater, they found a very interesting change in how they learn their songs. They were common across Australia, but since about the 1950s, their population has consistently shrunk, and now there's about three to 400 of them left. Very small population. Very, yeah. On a large continent. And so they're spread out, and they don't have a lot of population density. And while they used to have these big winter flocks when they first went out and started to learn the their songs now a lot of them are alone there's not a lot of other honey eaters around Aww. and so when they're they're learning their songs in their first year they don't have anyone to listen to and they Aww. learn by listening yes oh that makes me so sad no it's, it's a very uh, good looking bird by the way it's a beautiful for those, for those of you who are it's just a, it's listening the uh, black white and yellow Mm -hmm. yellow and black going in the feathers very very pretty bird yeah and so over this five-year study about 12 percent of male honey eaters they would wind up producing mangled versions of their songs (laughs) and they would mix it with other bird species because that's what they heard so they would mix up honey eater song with friar birds and cuckoo shrieks and all sorts of other birds that have ridiculous names um, so, so it ended up sounding wrong and kind of muddled. And those unconventional male singers at 12%, they were pretty consistently less successful in wooing a mate. Yeah, they're not yes. singing the right song. So, mm-hmm. and through selection, the females are like, I only like this song and you're not singing it. So then they're not excited. So the 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 kind of, avoidance by the females could be a few things obviously they're all based in selection but what is the motivation there why is this weird song a turnoff for them so (laughs) there's a couple ideas one is that um 
they don't recognize them as a potential partner because they don't sound yeah. like a honey eater. So they're just like, who are you? Stranger. Yeah. Stay away, stranger. Um, or <laughs> they they approach, but then the song takes a weird turn. It's like using a random word in the middle of a sentence and you're like, what? you okay? <laughs> right. um, and so there could be that. They feel like they're unfit or they're using their own cues or it's not sexy or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it would sound like a bot, like you were communicating with a bad AI. Yes, exactly, yes. Mm-hmm. Like, this sounds like a trap. Yes. Uh, welcome to my home. Can I offer you an artichoke? What? <laughs> huh? Uh, <laughs> Do you mean like a glass of water? I don't know. Anyway. Um, so, Here are some fresh tennis shoes. Uh, I thank you. I'm going to go. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> So there's this weird context thing that's happening that that doesn't really work. So this is an overarching larger concern. When a species population drops that depends on social learning, do you lose species knowledge from a population when a when a population size declines? So this this could be a, a much bigger problem that's an that's an important part of looking at endangered species that we haven't even really thought about before when population density drops (laughs) yeah when when population density drops do you lose social knowledge do you lose the movement of knowledge across a species Mm. so cultural knowledge within species is something that hasn't really been looked at too closely when it comes to declining populations so that's a huge thing now one thing that they actually did to see if there was a way they could fix this problem just experimentally is they took young birds into a captive breeding program and they either in some cases they played male song recordings for them and in other cases they housed them next to adult males and it appears to be working. It's very early in the testing, but it looks like the these younger males are impressionable enough that they're learning via these next door singers or a, a tape recorded message. So this could be helpful in small bits. This could be helpful maybe by putting a speaker out in the wild for some some animals that are known to winter in a specific area. But it, you know, yeah. it's, it's definitely a Band-Aid. It's not solving the bigger problem here. But, I mean, it's, it's a Band-Aid, but perhaps it would be enough of a Band-Aid to teach the young males the songs they need to learn so that there is actually more attraction with females mm-hmm. for mating, which could help to bolster the population sizes. Obviously, some males are, the, the population, although they're endangered, they're still kind of going, even though they're declining. So there are some good songs out there. There's some good mm-hmm. mates out there. And if the researchers and maybe, I mean, maybe this is the kind of thing that you that they could um, enlist people to help to put out recorders mm-hmm. during the breeding season to put out to put out players, speakers to play these songs so that. Yeah. So but that this, these young male birds can learn stuff. This sounds like not like a, sci- a citizen science project, if I ever heard one. Yeah. <laughs> but isn't this, I mean, do you, Blair, do you think this is crossed the threshold with 300 individuals? Yeah, it's a small where, population. Where, where you stop just trying to encourage in the wild and you start thinking about breeding programs. You mm-hmm. start right. thinking about uh, captive preservation yeah. And a rebuilding, like you know, we yeah. did, uh, California did with the condor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it- I think that's that's actually the thing I just got really excited about is thinking about captive breeding programs. So when you're doing captive breeding programs now, this is a really good wake up call that this needs to be part of the Love research it. when you develop a captive breeding program. Is there cultural knowledge? Is there social learning happening? during the time period of when your captive breeding is happening between when you pull eggs or hatchlings or whatever they are Mm -hmm. and when you release them into the wild because if there is then you have to figure that in or you are not going to have as successful of a program if they didn't know this they might pull a bunch of honey eaters put them in captivity raise them up throw them out in the wild and then be like why isn't the population going up right and this is the same the was it the whooping whooping crane the condors very similar there are um 
there are dances that some birds do yes. that and uh, there are some uh, some lessons you're right there are some lessons that young birds need to learn from older mm. birds to be successful as adults yeah ah birds need bird school they oh my do goodness. they're so yeah. special What's your next bird? What's your next sad bird story? <laughs> well, snowy plovers, uh, they're not going to get homeschooled by their mom because their mom, guess what? She leaving. She's like, um, I'm out. She's mm -hmm. out. So in snowy plovers, females will often ditch out on mm -hmm. their chicks. And so first of all, I have to explain why this happens. So there are equal numbers of female and male snowy plovers when they hatch. However, males, for whatever reason, just part of their biology, have survival advantages at all life stages. These guys live in really tough habitats. They breed on salt flats they, or in brackish inland lakes. They have a barren environment that puts huge pressure on them at all stages of life, but especially when they're parents. And they... Uh, they have temporary salt ponds where they grow, where they raise their babies. Those dry up and chicks can die of thirst or starvation during that time. So it's, it's tough to be a snowy plover. <laughs> but on top of that, it's harder to be a female snowy, snowy plover. And so there is a surplus of males when they reach adulthood. There are, adulthood. Yeah. There are more females than males, which flips wait. the script. Wait, wait. Or, there, there are more, are more males than females. Sorry. Okay, yes. good. Okay. So that flips the script on selection. And that actually means that the females have a huge advantage in finding my mates and that they can actually play the field because for each female, there are several males. Mm -hmm. So it might actually benefit them to try to have families with multiple males. There could be a benefit there because there's more males than females. So there, that opportunity presents itself biologically. Okay. So in snowy plovers, it's my instead of my two dads, it's my three dads, or maybe my right. four dads. Right. Yes. So that exists. On top of that, let's keep in mind that when we talk about how females put out all this extra um, energy and effort, when we've talked about that before, a lot of the time we're talking about mammals who have to carry babies with them. But these buddies can plop eggs down after a few days, and then those eggs will incubate for 20 to 30 days, and then they have to be taken care of by somebody, but it doesn't have to be the female. So actually, there is a possibility with birds for the female to lay eggs and leave. And there's also a pressure on the male to take care of babies because the females get their pick. And so if the females are selecting for males that take good care of the babies in the nest, they have the ability to make that choice, kind of pick the males who are going to make good dads. So all of this to say, the snowy plover culture is such that females are set up so that there is an evolutionary advantage to play the field. <laughs> On top of that, this is a study from Max Planck Institute for Ornithology in Germany. They actually wanted to see what the decision-making process was because the females don't always leave. Sometimes right. they do. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they leave their babies to be taken care of. Sometimes they leave their babies to die, which, sorry, that's nature. <laughs> that happens sometimes. So sometimes they're just cutting their losses. And so they wanted to see what the decision-making process was here. Why, why does a snowy plover leave her nest? And um, this is also, I brought it because it's, it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about because we want to talk about moms as being the ones, right? They are the child care giver, but that's not the case in humans. And that's not the case in the animal world either. either. It's kind of a, a broad brush that we've used. But I, I wanted to point this out because it's this is also the thing that we stereotypically talk about males doing in species. But this is something that, in this case, the females are doing. Yeah. So what they what they showed through the study, they they looked at um, 260 broods over seven years. Seventy percent of those broods were deserted by females. Chicks from abandoned broods did survive less often than the broods where females stayed longer. But part of the reason that that, ex that 
kind of data exists, the reason that indicator is there is because broods were also more likely to be deserted at the beginning of the breeding season when there weren't as many resources hmm. and when a chick died. Huh. So it was as if to say... I lost this, one. I'm going to lose them all. I got to go. Yes. I'm going to start over. There's something wrong with this batch. I got to start over. Yep. <laughs> Which sounds sounds very blasé. But this is this is part of this is part of nature. I'm sorry. This is part of trying to figure out how to get your DNA to go. Right. Is you have to yeah. make difficult decisions. And for example, boobies, they do this crazy thing where they it depends on the type of I think masked boobies actually physically kick out. They always have two checks. They kick one out. They pick which one is more likely to survive and they they ditch the other one completely. They say, I'm, I'm putting my resources into this one. The blue-footed boobies, I believe I'm getting this right, just neglect one. Yeah. And it's it sounds really scary because we want to put our own anthropomorphic stuff on there. But ultimately, at the end of the day, they're trying to make sure their DNA makes it. Yeah. And so it they have to make decisions that sound scary to us because we're putting them in our own frame. But really, that's what's happening here. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. We do anthropomorphize, and with birds, the brains are different, and emotions are and decisions are arrived at differently than the mammalian brain, for sure. But um, you know, we like to say, "Oh, it's a tough decision to leave your nest or to um, you know choose one chick over another," but it's very likely just sensory information and mm -hmm. the the parents are making a, an instinctual choice yep you know based on what they see what they smell what they you know what they're experiencing i also yeah. kind of wonder if uh if it's actually a more competitive uh mating environment for the females because there's less of them yeah so so if it if the it sort of it sounds like almost a little bit sideways because like why why would they have more competition? There's plenty to choose from. Yeah, but the, to get the good ones, get the mm -hmm. you know to go for if you're in charge of selection, you start to prioritize things more than if you're just lucky to find somebody. Oh, I'm just like the numbers the other way. It's just I'm just lucky to have found somebody. Thank you for mating with me. I'm going to mate with you and 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 then I'm so happy that you even like are here right now. Like just that's enough. <laughs> but if you are really being able to be choosy, mm -hmm. then that drive to compete in the selection process means, hey, you know what? It's not working out. You know, I need to get back in the game. And yep. before the the blossoms fall or whatever the time of the year it is, whatever, I need to have a new mate who is, is ready to go. And I want them to be a good one. So I need to go out there and select. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, that's the other piece, now. right, is uh, who's left who's not tending to a nest because the males are the ones that have to tend to a nest, right? So if you're, you have to start over because you feel like th this, mm -hmm. this set of chicks is not going to make it, you have to start over. You have to act quickly. You also have a very a short, you have a short mating season and breeding period. So you have, you have a ticking clock there before and, you and, lose a whole year. And where was the male bird? If they left, that's their job. They have one job mm -hmm. or two jobs. But the second job is watching. The if it's not yeah. there taking care of them, then I picked wrong. This is not going to be good for yeah. future generations. Well, and this is the other thing. So there is, it reminded me of the conversation we were having about the COVID vaccine. So there is a chance when the female leaves, there is a higher mortality rate. However, there's still a pretty high success rate. So it, it was like, it was making me think about, okay, yes. So there's this small group of people who are having blood clots and perhaps they would not have a blood clot if they did not take the vaccine, but their likelihood of dying from coronavirus is much higher. <laughs> or so, getting a so blood, blood clot that, right? from surviving Corona is also yep. a thing that's been happening. So yes. it's like, there's no. So would you be better off without either? Perhaps. But with these two choices, the female's choice is they have a pretty good shot of surviving with dad. I'm going to go try to make sure that I have some, some chicks that survive to next year. The, the one thing, I know we're not talking about the virus anymore, but the one thing about that uh, is that, <laughs> the one thing viruses. about it, though, is that I know how to take precautions to avoid getting the virus. Once the shot is in the arm, the fear is that you don't have control over it. So if they're, that's why they've shut it down. If it's, if it's going to do any harm, 
uh, in Denmark, I think, was the first one to stop. It's uh, all the Scandinavian countries, countries, several yeah. Southeast Asian countries, They're gonna European stop and countries. Yeah, try to delve deeper into it to figure yeah. it out. But uh, yeah, uh, the element of just not knowing and controlling that the numbers don't make sense to a human. Those clovers, the, though, they're just going to keep mating. They're going to uh, keep doing what yeah. they do. And they're those controlling snowy, what they can. And right? those exactly. cute little... Exactly. Is it the snowy plover? No, yes. it's the kill deer that, that, that drags the arm. The mama drags, drags her arm. Oh. Her, not her arm, her wing. Drags her oh, wings. Yes. Look at me. Come over here. I'm a decoy. Yes. No, the, the snowy plovers are the snowy ones plover. all over the Pacific coast yeah. that, that right. run back and forth from the tide and are mm-hmm. the reason you can't bring your dog on the beach. Yes. <laughs> Is there protected? Snowy plovers are cute. Mm-hmm. They're, they're adorable, adorable birds. And it, it turns out their their mom has... <laughs> kind of brutal. Their right. mom is... Uh, she's she's a working mom. She's Dad's working staying mom. home with the kids. Her job is having a second family. So She's like, I got to go have another family right now. See you, kids. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. That's what it takes to survive. Pass on those genes. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. This is This Week in Science. It really is. We're talking about science. Hey, are you enjoying the show? Please tell a friend. We love it when you do that. This is time now to come back. Justin, oh. ah. what did you bring to talk about? Uh, did I have more stories? You don't. You do. Wondering? Do oh, you? Yeah. You tell uh, me. So this is a, this is an international team, 26 different authors on this single paper, including six of them came out of UC Santa Barbara. Uh, they just published in the journal Nature. And they kind of looked at the problems that are besetting mankind's future uh, and really did a pretty uh, narrow observation on what, what needs to be done to protect our oceans. So... The researchers identified specific areas of the ocean that could provide multiple benefits if protected. Safeguarding these regions that they suggest would protect nearly 80% of marine species. And in by doing that, also increase fishing catches by more than 8 million metric tons by having preserved areas where the fish that are getting fished can be free to breed. And also prevent the release of more than 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide by protecting the seafloor bottom from trawling, which is a destructive fishing practice that I didn't realize uh, contributed that much to to carbon dioxide into the oceans, but it does. This is Cody Voice of Enrique Sala, an explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society. Ocean life has been declining worldwide because of overfishing, habitat destruction, and climate change. Yet, only 7% of the ocean is currently under some kind of pr- uh, protection. And what they are encouraging is, even though there's this, there's these, these uh, there specific areas that would be the most useful, they know it's going to come down to every single nation, country, society having to dictate laws over the waters that they control. But what they're pushing for is getting to 30 percent for seven percent protected waters now they want to push it up another 23 percent to get us to 30 percent protection by the year 2030 as the minimum that we need to have any shot at a sustainable future on planet earth so protect the waters everybody we can do this i mean come on we've done so much this year for covid research and it takes focus. It takes money, but this is something we can do. So this is this is something I think about all the time is is what to do about the the international waters and the things that you know no one has any control over. And uh, actually something that we talk about at home all the time is what if Aquaman was real? <laughs> like, and it's really it would take somebody who talks about this all the time. Me and Brian, we talk about okay, that. Okay, and, okay. And I th- okay. I'm just making sure because I'm like, I missed those conversations yeah, no, completely. And specifically, the other day, he was talking about <laughs> Namor, who I, I didn't know who he was, but he's like the Marvel version of Aquaman. But anyway, the idea that like there would have to be somebody with a voice living physically in the ocean to be able to come out and be like, you can't use this anymore. You got to go. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> you're you're being so disrespectful with the space that we live. You well, gotta go. At the beginning, we need the... happy feet to happen. We yeah. need big... that penguin with with uh, Robin Williams' voice to come out of the aquarium we dancing, had we, we had teaching it. us not to destroy the ocean. Come on. We had it earlier this year, the end of last year. I can't remember exactly what it was. The orca that were turning fishing boats around. Yes. Mm-hmm. And like ruining propellers and like physically pushing boats out of the fishing lanes. Yeah. Uh, we, those voices are being they are raising their voices as best they can for something that lives yeah, underwater yeah they need to so. speak English and carry a trident is the point <laughs> <laughs> okay. exactly come okay. on but they do uh, yeah they do actually uh, have targets that are located in international waters they have uh, areas of the mid-Atlantic ridge uh, the Master Seen Plateau in the Indian Ocean Nazca Ridge off uh, west coast of South America and the mm-hmm. southwest Indian Ridge between Africa and Antarctica. So there's other areas that they have pointed to in international waters that, if protected, would also massively both reduce the uh, contribution to global warming, but also create a sustainable ocean fishery for future generations to come. You know what would be great, actually, is instead of anything's allowed in international waters, nothing's allowed. (laughs) It's like, hey, just no, have, don't do we it. We have no control over the space. So guess what? You can't do anything but sail through it. <laughs> I like that. I like that too. Eh, okay, and no one will agree to it. Okay, what's no. your last story? Uh, <laughs> wait, wait a second. Wait a second. That can't be our attitude for trying to address global warming issues and sustainable oceans. <laughs> Nobody will listen to it and just move on. That's... <laughs> What is that? That's my line, by the way. You just stepped on. That's what I. That's my take on this show is All to right. be the pessimistic one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, uh, this is a uh, a uh, hundred thousand year old DNA was pulled out of the mud of a lake in uh, in the Arctic. This is uh, I think it's called. I think this is Baffin. Is it Baffin Island? Uh, yeah, like Baffin, Baffin Island. Which is located in the northeastern side of Arctic Canada, uh, sort of right across from Greenland territory of Nanuvot and the lands of the Kwikwetani Inuit. Fun fact, Baffin Island, fifth largest island on planet Earth. Did you know that? No, now I do. No, because nobody goes to that island because it's freezing cold. (laughs) So they put, but they did what they did was they did that sort of environmental DNA thing where they just have sediment and they tested DNA of what was in the sediment underneath this this Arctic lake that was there, and they found evidence of a shrub. They found a shrub that doesn't grow there. In fact, the, the shrub is native to northern Canada, some 250 miles south. This is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Sarah Krop, researcher of the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research at the time of the study, quoting here, We have this really rare view into a particular warm period in the past that was arguably the most recent time that it was warmer than present in the Arctic. That makes it really useful analog for what we might expect in the future. Uh, dwarf birch is the species of shrub that they found. It's uh, kind of a knee-high type of a growing thing. Tends to pop up uh, under the tundra, so it's you got the snowy tundra in uh, in in Canada there, and then this shrub shows up everywhere, and it turns things very green. And it kind of creates a bit of a heat feedback loop, in that it kind of the ice around it, the snow around it, will melt, and then it can of course use this water, and and that's how it survives. But it doesn't grow anywhere past uh, a certain point in the southern part of the Baffin Island in the Canadian Arctic because it's just too cold. Cody voice again, this is, it's pretty significant difference from the distribution of tundra plants today. Again, that's Crump. She's actually currently postdoctoral in the Paleogenomics Lab, University of California, Santa Cruz. So one of the things that, you know, we're talking about here though is this is 
this is from a hundred uh, 116 to 125 thousand year old uh, sediment where this shrub was in this location and when we get Get into cooler periods, it normally goes, it takes like thousands of years as these arcs of temperature uh, rise and fall. We're doing things very quickly now. So one of the, one of the points that this story, uh, study sort of brings up is, yes, there are plants that can survive other places, but how do they move there? And does, like, this is something that can survive if the temperature that we're going to see at the end of the century is nine degrees Fahrenheit, five degrees Celsius higher than it was at the pre-industrial because the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the planet. These are very, very achievable. Does where the plant is now make it inhabitable for this shrub? Can't, will it transport? Will it begin to move? If it can't move yeah. in time, it dies. Uh, and so this isn't, this is just one shrub, right? Uh, that has that has moved, has backed off 250 miles of territory, but doesn't have another 250 miles of territory to itself that it can live in either. It's in this band where the the, the its biome is secure, and it can function and it, it can exist. So there's you know this is one specific shrub, but the implications of this are for every form of tree and plant life on this planet. That if you can see a 250 mile change in territory of its ideal habitable zones, that could be absolutely devastating uh, to the. Oh, wait, wait, that's right. And we should pass a law uh, to get people to. But they won't do anything about it, so why bother? Damn, I have to do my. Uh, you're, yeah, you're, you're following up on it? Okay, I have good. To do my thing. <laughs> That's pretty interesting, though, that these, yeah, these plants, right, maybe someday soon the plants of today will be competing against their ancestors. No. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, I mean, they, well, so but, but, but the point is, like, can you picture, like, having to take, like, okay, all right, we have to move the, the, uh, the, the desert cactus 250 oh, right. miles north 50 and miles replant north. it. Yeah. Or 50 miles or whatever, like start having to like move all of the plants. That's a lot of work, people. We don't, we're, come on. I know humans, we're much we don't lazier move the, than moving We don't move all the, of plants. the plants. The plants move themselves. We're I mean, too we lazy. force the situation that's causing yeah. the moving of the plants. But it's going to happen too quick for the plants to do it. So what I'm saying is if we're too lazy to move all of the plants 100 miles north or whatever it takes, we should just stop warming the planet. Yeah. yeah, that would be Good easier. Point. It would be it would be easier. Let's just not do it, everybody. Let's do okay. The easy thing and save the hard thing for later. Yes. You think it was Kennedy who said that? We're gonna do the easy <laughs> thing, put off doing hard things to some other time. We should do it that way. Sometimes the that... easy thing is the right thing. <laughs> Why do Irish eyes cry? Why do any eyes cry? Because they're sad. Well, it's because of your lacrimal glands. Yeah. I mean, come on. Lacrimal glands. Yes, and researchers have decided that, yes, we need to grow lacrimal glands from stem cells in a Petri dish. Of course we do. To understand exactly how they work and what genes are involved. This is important to understand this. Actually, it is very important. The researchers say that the lacrimal glands and the act of crying, the tear production, is not really fully understood, like so many other things. But there are disorders like dry eye and dry mouth that um, are genetically related that if we could figure out how to treat them, if we could understand how these this part of the eyes work, it could help out a lot of people. Anyway, researchers took the lacrimal glands from mice, stem celled them up, grew them in dishes, and then um, looked to see how they grew and whether, like really, whether they could grow them in dishes. That was the main, the main point of their work was, can we grow them outside of an animal? And yes, indeed, they could. They were able to get full 
organ growth. Um, they found all the cell types. They did have to mix up their chemical cocktail a little bit to get the glands to work. Um, but when I say get the glands to work, they made these tear, gra- tear glands cry in a dish with the addition of norepinepre- norepinephrine. So in case you didn't know, chemical signal for tear production in your eyes is norepinephrine. Uh, Now you know. So the researchers were able to actually get tear production to occur in a dish. Then they used uh, knockout technology to knock different genes out to see how that affected tear production. They found one gene called PAX6 completely dismantled tear production. Tears were not formed. The lacrimal glands didn't do what they needed to do. It just, they, it was a big shame, a shamble, no tears. The glands had no tears. I have no tears for you, they said to the researchers. Well, they didn't really, but the end of the story is now they have some direction to go in the study of the genes that are related to uh, to tear production the development of the lacrimal glands, and there is a syndrome which is called Sjogren's Silt Syndrome, which does result in dry eyes, dry mouth, um, and a lot of pain for people because of it, and it is related to a mutation in the Pax 6 gene, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when I- Irish eyes are crying, norepinephrine has been released... And the lacrimal glands are producing tears. Right when at the beginning of the story, uh, in, the, in the end of the intro of the story, when you're like, and did they do it? I would just kind of wish you had said no. <laughs> like, as it gave me this, like, we should do like a null, uh, a null report. <laughs> did they do it? The no. Nope, didn't okay. work. <laughs> Researchers are studying if they could combine these two elements and create this other thing, and it didn't work. Oh my gosh. Okay, <laughs> researchers. Like okay, researchers <laughs> who are studying things, please send us your null results. Yes, please. Can you can you send us your re- null results? If you're a researcher and you have null results, we'll make a collection. Mm-hmm. They don't even need result. to be current. We'll make an exception. Yeah. They don't we have will, to be current. One of my best friends got her PhD started. on a null result. Send yes. it in. Yes. But it was yes. it was fascinating when I saw her defense and it was very interesting actually. Yeah. Oh, those but are, I find I think them. that will yeah. be a fun episode. We'll they were looking at this and they were asking this question and they did all these things and did they find it? No. no. <laughs> no. Apparently there's no mechanism there whatsoever. It's just a correlation. Oh, I can't wait. This will be a great episode. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, because there are, I mean, in honesty, there are way more null uh, results than there are uh, positive. Yeah. Real, uh, positive hits or really enlightening ones. Yeah. And all of those do lead uh, to a narrowing. It's part of the whole scientific process. It's all part of it. Um, we should, I've always wanted to do a journal, too, that was just the null results. Like, okay, if you did, yep. you did this experiment, you spent all the time, just write it up, send it to us. We'll still publish. You'll still publish. Yeah. I think that there might result. be a journal of null results by now. I think enough people have talked about it. I think there needs to be a database that's searchable. So if somebody was <laughs> setting up an experiment, they can go find that five other or ten other people have tried it. And, and it and didn't gotten, work gotten hopefully at least a consistent null result if you have inconsistently null results that's not good or, yeah. but somewhat consistent null results you see how they did it you can go oh all of them missed trying it this way something you know there's like a whole body of information that's left out of the conversation by not having a, a database of null of what results. was tried and how and what didn't work yeah if i may yeah. The International yes. Journal of Negative and Null Results is a peer-reviewed, open-access science journal that publishes original research papers, review articles, and essays, specifically focused on experiments that produced no positive results. Oh, excellent. Yes. And so just then, Trenton Moody was posting that in the YouTube chat. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, they definitely, um, You, in order, if somebody's doing it as a PhD or a master's project, they have to do a write-up. And that's that was my understanding from going to this this defense was that 
that does go somewhere and that does benefit future science to have that null experiment. That no so that's I love that they have that journal and that they've started doing this because that I like was your not idea a thing. Of the, I like the database idea though. It has to be honest. a searchable yeah. database too, though, and and it yeah. has to have be. how the science, yeah. uh, how the experiment was constructed. And I, when you think about when you think about the tens, hundreds of thousands of yeah. published scientific articles that are out there, and there's how many journals of null results? When null results are the majority. more. Yeah. <laughs> often yeah. yeah well and that's the other thing right. too is how many people end up having to start over on their graduate work because they got a null result and their advisor wants them to have something that's kind of prettier <laughs> well, and and a large part of it too i think could just be a, a, a database really not about the result so much it has less to do with that sometimes than the design of experiment uh, if the same design of experiment has yep. been utilized many, many, many times, you can still look at the thing, but you're going to have to devise a different way of, of, of testing or, or experimenting because yeah, anyway, yeah, we can, we need to pull that resource somehow. Someday in the there, perfect future with science rules. I'm sure there's something there that within science, the scientists are sciencing. Anyhow, uh, my final story. Oh, you people with green eyes. I'm just thinking green eyes for Irish, but it's not necessarily. Brown eyes is probably very common for the Irish. Justin, are you showing off your eyes? <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, researchers at King's and Erasmus University Men Medical Center in Rotterdam have identified 50 new genes for eye color so we all not all of us 50. but i mean when in school 50. The, the, yeah in school i learned genetics using the punnett square mm -hmm. and dominant and recessive genes for say brown eyes you know big b's brown eyes little b's blue one out of four is blue oh look how that works very simplistic but <sighs> That gave me my understanding of yeah. modern genetics and eye color. <laughs> it's a bit more complex than that, just a little bit. Uh, it was published in Science Advances and looked at over 195,000 people across Europe and Asia. Hopefully, this isn't just a study looking at eye color, but will help understanding of eye disease and pigmentary glaucoma, ocular albinism as well, uh, where eye pigment is actually related to disease in the eye in some way or another. Uh, additionally, they found that eye color in Asians with different shades of brown is genetically similar to eye color in European Europeans that range from dark brown to light blue so same genes mm -hmm. so there's different other shading genes involved different yeah. pigment yeah really fascinating there um yeah so there, previously it had been discovered there... and yellow and like <laughs> yellow yellow i have a friend who's got who's got just yellow eyes there's no wow. other yeah Right, and that's definitely unique. So how many genes are involved in that? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes have heterochromia, so they have two different colored eyes, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah, so anyway, eye color. It's not just two genes, as some scientists a long time ago previously thought. Then it was a dozen genes. Now it's over 50. 50. Over 50 genes for eye colors. So your beautiful, beautiful ocular sockets are pigmented very complexly. And yeah, that complexity I think, I think is beautiful. If, if I may, I think there's mm -hmm. still certain things that are heavily dominant, right, within all of that. They're probably, yeah, it depends on how they're my, linked. Right? My dad's entire side has these extremely dark brown eyes, like so dark, you, they almost look black. Mm -hmm. And I have them. And I think that um, they, there's something there because, you know, all of these Bazdurichs all the way down, they 
a lot of the married people with light eyes. My mom has light eyes. Lots of people have light eyes in that family, but their kids pretty much always ended up with these really, 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 really dark eyes. And uh, it's a, you know, it's very anecdotal. But I, I, I think that you know, the the Punnett square might be an oversimplification, but there's For definitely sure. there's definitely some interesting stuff going on there with dominance with the with the eye colors too. Just like with hair too, like curly hair is dominant, but you can also have weird mixtures of hair and two yeah. out of my three kids have blue eyes and you have brown eyes no green eyes i have i think i have the hazel i have the both both so my pop said uh blue eyes and my mother has brown eyes they're kind of hazily they've got a little yeah, green hazily. yeah too. Uh, yeah so I, think I got I was going to say from there, from the abstract for this paper, which is in Science Advances, they say we identified 124 independent associations arising from 61 discrete genomic regions, including 50 previously unidentified. We find evidence for genes involved in melanin pigmentation, also associations involved in iris morphology and structure. And then they go on to discuss the uh, Asian versus European eye coloration. Collectively, they say that their results explain 53.2% of eye color variation using common single nucleotide polymorphisms. So there is still more to be discovered. Mm. If their findings only explain about 50%, it's only halfway there. There's so much more to find. More associations needed. More study of eyes. Let researchers gaze deeply into your eyes. Maybe. Maybe not quite. Have we come to the end of another episode? I think, I think we all need to do this. Just come on, close. Come on. Oh, Are we going to get it? Oh, great. We can all Hold on. I can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I can't okay. get any closer. <laughs> my my camera's not on autofocus. <laughs> Look at these eyes. <laughs> we can all now not work in top security. For the That's government. right. <laughs> Forever. Uh, all shit. eyes on you, everyone. Our eyes are on you. I hope all of your eyes are on your calendars and marking them for April 17th. Saturday, April 17th, for the Twist DTNS crossover whip, 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 whip episode. <laughs> Science, times, technology. Is that when it is? Did I get it wrong? I think that's right. Um, that's yeah, it. so if, if you are <laughs> being Pacific have, time. No, 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 I'm, not, I'm not saying you got it wrong. I just uh, cursed me. Uh, anyway, yeah, we'll talk about it in the after show. Um, anyway, if you have something that you would like us to talk about related to the cross of science and technology, it could be a specific story. It could be a larger topic. Please let us know. You can. Uh, we're going to tell you how to find us in a second in all the myriad of ways. But any of those ways, tell us if there's something that you want us to bring to the show. Yes. Thank you. But mark your calendars. More details will come. Twists. DTNS crossover. I really, for some reason, I really want to play it out. Are we going to be fighting? No. Is is there a monster truck involved? Monster. It's like a monster truck rally, but science and technology. So (laughs) it's going to be amazing. What day of the week is that? Is that a Saturday? It's a Saturday. 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 Yes. Science, 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 technology. It's going to be amazing. So much fun. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the show. We are so glad that you were here with us tonight. Tonight. Thank you for joining us tonight. I put a list somewhere. Now I don't know where it went. There it is. Okay. There's my list. Tonight. Tonight. It's time for me to give shout outs. Thank you. Thank you to my co-hosts. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Blair. Thank you, Fada, for all of your help on social media and for show notes. Thank you, Gord, for your help in the chat room. Identity4 for recording the show. Rachel, for all of your assistance. And I would like to thank our Patreon sponsors. 
Thank you, too. Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Andre Bissett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Jonathan Styles, aka Don Stylo, John Chio, Lee Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Shubru, Darwin Hannon, Donald Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredus 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Ryan Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Kessenflow, Jean Tellier, Steve Leesman, aka Z McKen, Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Rails back, flying out, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Massaro, Artie, I'm Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rit- <laughs> Robert Coburn, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Matt Sutter, Phil Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapo, Sarah Chavis, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O. Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Percararo, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, head on over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link. On next week's show... We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to multitask? Do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Get some science fix while you do the dishes, bake a cake... Go for a walk. Just search for This Week in Science over podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you heard today, and show notes, links to stories, that sort of thing, they're all available on our website. Just go on over to www.twist.org, and you can sign up for a newsletter if you like. Oh, that's right. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, in that subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into a tear duct, I guess. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. The smallest oh, tear duct face. you've ever seen. You can also ping us on Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi Cause it's this week in science This week in science 
This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science science, science, science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science This week in science This week in science This week in science, 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 this week in science. science. That was funny. (laughs) I like this dance, Blair. (laughs) (laughs) Trying to do that not mirrored is insane. It's really yeah. hard. You're like, okay, which which side am I on? Which yeah. way do I go? I'm not mirrored. What? No, what? I'm mirrored. Hold on. Can you get it? There. Okay, make a rectangle. Wait. Oh, no, wait. There we, there we go. You're like you Ralph. Go. I'm a rectangle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a rectangle. I'm a rectangle. Rectangle. We had a fun long show. Mm-hmm. See, <laughs> we should have. We could do a weekly three. No problem. Mm-hmm. For regular drive time. Yeah. <laughs> no problem, man. How's your week going? Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty Groot. Pretty Groot. 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 Um, He's Groot. We we unpacked the last of the large boxes last weekend, which was nice. Mm-hmm. Oh, I went, nice. I went on a very short run this morning. It's the first one since I hurt myself, so that was good. Oh, good. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Get back into things. That's good. Yeah. And uh, I, See, I, I'm i seven going. days post-vax, so Woo-hoo! yeah, I'm pretty excited about You're that. You're like, go antibodies, go! You got this! You got this, antibodies! You can do yeah. this! And I got the good old J&J, so in one more week, I'll be a superhero. So is it only two weeks? Like, or, I mean, isn't it like after four weeks that they, or later even, that they say that it, like, it, it kind of continues to... I I had heard 14 days, but hmm. I don't not, right. that's a good question. I thought it was like a I mean, they say 2 weeks, but I think they ha- there has there have been reports that even later there are improvements. Let's see. What's the CDC say? Mm-hmm. I like Eric in Alaska. Thank you for this beautiful picture of honeycomb. <laughs> I also Texas got the. Uh, I also got the shot. Did you get the Justin Johnson you got also? The shot no, too? I got the Moderna. Moderna. So I gotta wait. I gotta wait uh, four weeks from when I got it till to uh, get I can get another too. one. Nice. And then, and then, uh, even then, there's a waiting period after that before it's, in, it's considered in full. Right. Uh, full effect but yeah uh, already it's supposedly starting working yes. doing things yeah i think it was uh, two or three weeks i know for pfizer two weeks after the first pfizer shot you're supposed to be like 60 percent protected but again that was before um the variant so 
Who knows? Um, so this says Johnson & Johnson, 66.3% uh, effective. Um, two weeks. That Moderna. Nice. Two weeks after receiving it. Um, and that the, the effectiveness they're looking at there is any COVID-19 illness at all. 66% effective, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, people had the most protection two weeks after, and then four weeks after, no one has had to be hospitalized with COVID-19 so far. Yeah, so four weeks later, it, it, it's not, yeah, that's, that was the number that I remembered was the four weeks later. Yeah. Nice. I like Stephen Rain. He got a shot of whiskey. Good. I hope for St. Cool. Patrick's Day, it was a shot of Irish whiskey. Yeah. So I don't if, have any. I can't believe I'm out of Irish whiskey on St. Patrick's Day. I'm so sad. I have a Guinness I, in my fridge and I forgot to pour it. I ended up pouring in a gin and soda instead. <laughs> and then just like I have no cabbage. I have I mean I could maybe make like, like a late soda bread or something. I got nothing. It's all right. I missed out <laughs> on pie like, day too. It's, I just it's can't a crazy do these time. things during pandemic. There's no Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, I was figuring out for a second there, but I think I got it sold up. Uh, uh, I'm going to be flying uh, on the 15th. If so everything, you'll be if everything fine goes. Fine for the show on the 17th. The 17th will be. I don't know what. I'll probably still be in this time zone at that point. So, it'll probably be just fine. Um, Wait, like, are uh, you coming jet back? Lag. Where? You no, know, I'll you... I'll have just gotten there, so that's good. So that's mentally, good you'll still so circadian rhythm wise, you'll I'll still be still in this time zone. Be yeah. It should oh, be fine. so you'll also be fresh off your second dose, getting yes, on the airplane. Very. Yikes. Good way to do math. Fresh. Ooh. Way to do math. Uh, completely fresh. <laughs> like like how many days between you getting the second dose and getting on an airplane? Three. Okay, you should be fine. Well, no. So here's the thing. <laughs> I was flying anyway. Yeah. I, I've been flying this whole time anyway. Oh, no, no, no. That's not the what I mean. I mean, if you have safest chills, place taking an airplane while having chills would suck. Is no, I, I've, had, I've, had no, I've had absolutely zero even noticing other than it's in muscle. So it's like it's, it's like getting punched in the arm or something. But uh, other than that, it, yes, I have had no, no kind of anything. The, I was convinced I was going to have no response because I've had no response to any inoculation ever, really. Um, but I, uh, I did at right around the twelve-hour mark. I, I just got some. I just got, started getting like kind of a little bit achy, and then I went to bed. And by before I went to sleep, I was shivering. I took some Tylenol, uh -huh. and I was done. It was, it was fine. And then that was it. That was it. So Tylenol actually inactivates the anybody so you might no it wanna... doesn't no it doesn't no it doesn't that was a whole thing that don't, had to be say don't say stories like oh, that man, i know because everything goes oh by the way you know also, what you and justin said on this week in science that wasn't yeah, don't that listen was, to that justin was, that He's misinformation was going around which was which was okay, a big I, I, just, I just make it up that to tell a joke and now it turns oh, out yeah, it's no, already gone worldwide thing. i'm sorry so here's another myth because this is one i had to look up because i was very nervous about this because i have to take a test before I get on that plane, like right before, I have to have results of a test that was within 24 hours of getting in the plane. Oh, you were afraid you were going to get caught a caught positive COVID test from the vaccine. From the from the shot. So I looked yeah. it up and there is no there is no positive tests from any of the vaccines. That's a myth. Okay. So, so if you Good. tested positive and you're like, ah, but it's just because I had the vaccine. No, it isn't. No, you, you had the vaccine <laughs> and you got it. Yeah. You got the, it's, so. Well, that's the thing that's really scary, too, is like, I think there are people out there who, you know, I was misinformed, clearly, but there's people who like aren't doing the 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 due diligence to figure out when it's okay to go out. And um, I'm sure like, a couple days after the vaccine, they're like, I want to go hang out with my friends. It's like, oh, yeah. no, not yet. No, uh, I I've just had I've this experience with it. my family. Yeah, oh. I've, I've, I've so, absolutely seen it, too. Can I, I just, I was just the wet blanket and oh, I, I yeah. am officially the family wet blanket. 
I will be your family's wet blanket also. Yeah. If your friends need yeah. a wet blanket, no, I'm I will be too. the wet blanket. <laughs> I I that I have taken on that role apparently. Yeah, yeah my uh, a family member said, oh, let's all get together for Easter because the grandparents are vaccinated now and I'm vaccinated and these family members had COVID, so they're totally immune. Oh. And I was like, oh, funny thing about natural immunity. And of course, and I'm talking to Marshall and I'm like, yeah, you know, and I to- I was really trying to hold back and be nice about it. I did. He's like, he looks at me, he goes, it's funny you thought that was holding back. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, but I, uh, yeah, so I, I laid some stuff out there about immunity and how how it works and how it doesn't work. Basically that, you know, your body could have decided to be immune to some other part that doesn't really matter. And it could get mutated and oh, suddenly you get sick again with COVID. This is what happens with the flu. Different parts change. Your body doesn't recognize it. You're able to get sick. And I'm like, so I explain this and then a few hours later, the family oh, well, maybe we are jumping the gun a little bit and maybe we do need to still consider it. I'm like, thank you. Please don't make me. And I was like, I'm sorry. And they're like, they were like, it's okay. And I'm like, I don't think you think that, but okay. (laughs) Well, the other thing that I've had to deal with throughout being the wet blanket was people saying, I'm already in a high risk profession. So. So what's more risk? Exactly. Not, it's basically not, like, matter? if I'm going to get sick, it's going to be from work. It's not going to be from hanging out with you. And it's like, what? You have, why do you have zero understanding? Like, you, but it's, work. It's, well, it's also just like, don't you want to mitigate any risk? Like, control the things you can control. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people also now, the vac- vaccine's coming out, and people, like we've talked about, COVID fat- fatigue mm-hmm. is. Huge. People are tired. So They're yeah. done. Like some people are like, I I don't care. Like just yeah. done. And it's not a matter of wanting to help anymore. They're tired. Yeah. Gonna, it, yeah. So I was reading an article. I wish I had all the sciencey words for it, but there's a there's an actual psychological thing that happens right now when you have been through this fatigue with no end in sight for the past year. And now Mm -hmm. there's an end in sight, but the timeline for that end is super unclear. It's still vague. And you don't trust it. There's still so much that could go wrong between here and there, right? And so it actually in some cases prevents, creates worse psychological effects, which is funny because I have, I felt, you know, I've had like the COVID gloomies over the past year in one way or another, but I do feel like over the past month or so, it became more acute. Everybody, so many, there have been articles about it all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. People are really starting to feel it. Well, and also because like all of a sudden now, all of our workplaces are now talking to us about going back to the office. And about this being a real thing that's going to happen soon. And it's terrifying because not everyone's vaccinated. They haven't come up with plans on how to share space. Mm -hmm. They haven't come up with plans on how to, um, you know, the HR side of if you're going to work partially from home and partially at work and how that's going to impact your your productivity and all this. And so many workplaces have have expected no change in productivity throughout the pandemic, which is also super frustrating. Yeah. So like this new massive disruption, maybe you figured out a way to function working from home and now there's gonna be another massive disruption and there's gonna be an expectation for continued efficiency. Mm-hmm. And it is very scary. <laughs> yeah, I'm so the Portland schools are gonna open back up. Um, and sched- there, there's two months left in the school year. Spring break starts next week. It's a week long. And then there's basically two months left. Yeah. And they're like, let's let the teachers have another week to get their selves together to teach in the classrooms and then open the classrooms up. Right, right. And I'm like, can we can we not? Can we just wait? Yeah. Can we just just yeah. wait a little? I mean, I know we have a really like our rate of infection is, or not, yeah, not infection, but yeah, our rate of infection is very low. The test positivity rate is very low right now in Multnomah County, and that's fantastic. Um, But (laughs) 
I, I am concerned about the rush to, to open, the rush to return yeah. to normal, because that's how we end up playing whack-a-mole, because we have Absolutely. no patience and we have no bil- ability. Yeah. So well, yes, and, let's you know, make the... plans, but like make those plans for like five, six months from now, like start the slow ramp up. <laughs> the the thing uh, also I have a couple teacher friends who the the poor teachers so the the funny I thing so here is the teachers they're going they have to rush now to get back into the classroom and by the time they establish decor and procedures and some sort of normalcy for their classroom it's going to be summertime yep it's it, it's, it's, it's dumb it's, it's dumb say the word it's yeah. dumb it's dumb whoever yeah, and the kids whoever's in charge is dumb and the teachers who finally started to get the hang of teaching online, the kids who've gotten the hang of being at home and doing school, like, and the parents who, yes, want to go and want to go back to work and have their time again, but it's going to disrupt schedules that have become the only consistent thing in this yeah. time of chaos. And I am pissed that my son's schedule is going to be just thrown away and mm-hmm. for two months... We have to do this new thing. I'm pissed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I, I'm pissed at that. But then, like, the, the fact that the teachers are going to be doing this, I decided not to send Kai back to the classroom because I don't think it's – they're only doing, like, two hours of in-person schooling per day. It's not for my schedule. It's not worth it for me to disrupt my schedule to take him to school and then have to go right back It's not go worth pick it him for up. him. It's not good for him either. It's and he And it. the kids – the kids are going to go. They're going to sit in a classroom that's yeah, ventilated, but they're not going to be allowed to it's play so together. Yeah. It's, it's just to go to school and look at a computer because mm-hmm. they're going to be right. on their computers at school. Yeah. Right. Did you, <laughs> like this, this, this whole, like, the whole. It's dumb. Priority, it's, it's dumb. Just, <laughs> thank you. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yes, it is dumb. <sighs> and we need to stop having dumb people make the controlling decisions of our present because this is what screws up our future this is what's been happening that's why this whole thing has been such a whole thing is that dumb people were allowed (laughs) to make decisions for the rest of us you always have to have somebody making decisions for larger groups of people that's just kind of how it works when you're in society you have people who make decisions that affect a lot of people yeah. But what you don't want is for dumb people to be making those decisions. And I don't understand why we collectively can't prevent dumb people from making our decisions. I don't understand why that is still this difficult in this day and age. I don't think it's always dumb people. Sometimes I think it is um, it is people who are sick of being yelled at and just want to do whatever people have been yelling them to do. So th- this is something also that like my county went into a new tier and the less restrictive tier today. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. That's and great. so, and this is, I mean, it is great, except the color they do it. Great. They do it the second, the second the numbers drop to where they want yeah. them to be mm-hmm. Their Their rule isn't when the numbers have dropped and then two weeks late, two weeks later, cause you know, there's Stabilize. a latency Stabilize. with COVID. So mm-hmm. we know there's a two week lag in COVID numbers. So when it dips and it stays dipped for two weeks, how about then you change the tier? You don't do it the day that your ICU uh, capacity drops. It's, yeah. I just, I just, it, it, because also, what do they do? Because we moved into the orange tier. Open balls, open bars, open restaurants. Yeah. So it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And if you're colorblind, rates going to go back up again. You don't even know what, what tier you're yeah. in at any given yeah. point. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> What so, zone are we in? Are we in the light brown or the other brown? Yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit. It's a little. Bit. So, so, and and where is this pressure coming from? Mm-hmm. Well, I did. So, because parents, a lot of parents, and they did a survey at my school. A mm-hmm. lot of parents. It was like 70 percent of the parents wanted the kids to go back to school. Seventy percent of parents don't like their kids. I, I, it's a higher number than I thought it would be. To be so quite honest, I, the survey I results. Just, I was shocked. Yeah, I have I to shocked. throw in there too. We have to remember, there are low-income families who like are stuck leaving their eight-year-old at home on a computer by themselves. Right? Like this. This is happening, and so yeah. The, yeah. that's part of the problem too. Is that from day one, 
resources for low-income families have not existed, right? So if mm -hmm. that existed properly from day one, then there wouldn't be this additional pressure to put kids back in the classroom because there'd be a place for children to go whose parents have to go work in the grocery store. I'm going to tell you that my school district is not a low, it's, it's not high income, but it's not a low income district. And that's not the problem. It's parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> parents who want their kids to yeah. go back well, to school. Well, it, it's also <laughs> sure. it's also because it's you need to get the kids out of the house. Oh yeah, the kids need to because socialize, I think those, right? No, 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 no. Nothing to do with the kids. No, no. You need to be able to vocalize your desire to have a divorce and get that fight over <laughs> oh. and done with because it's been building. You've been you were on the cusp. No. You weren't sure, oh, but boy. now. After Justin. a year of being forced to live with the person you realized was a mistake that you made sometime in the past, but now you're stuck with on a daily basis, and you're really... Re it was fine. When you both left for work, you came back, you shared a meal, you went to bed, you didn't talk a whole lot through the week because everybody's got all these schedules, and we got to take some, the little, giant, little softball game, baseball game, over, do the thing. Now, the people have been stuck with each other, and they're like, I can't wait not to go back to normal i can't wait to leave this relationship oh, i geez. need to get Just out so. and the first step is getting the kids out of the house uh, so you can express yourself at full volume sometimes you're a snowy plover who just has to leave the nest you know just gotta get out just gotta get out this, this was the you know what there's other birds oh, near the boy. sea yep it's I can I can tell you I, I watched a, a town hall. I'm a snowy plover, mama. Gotta go. I gotta, I gotta go. It was just it was just it was, nest. it was twenty people in a row yelling at all of the 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 town the city council. It was it was like watching an episode of Parks and Rec at town hall, right? And it, so it was, but luckily because it was virtual, they could cut people off when their two minutes is up, which was very yeah. satisfying. That's but, that's great. But everybody everybody was just complaining. Let the kids play their sports. Let the kids play their sports. Open up the schools. Let the kids play their sports. That was the whole conversation the whole time. Um, which I get. I get that it's 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 a it's a pretty big deal to a lot of children and a lot of families. But like also, uh, perspective. People. Perspective. Like Thunder Beaver in the <sighs> chat room says uh, they're so they're so afraid their kids will be all messed up because that's the stigma of homeschooled kids. And I think that's a really interesting comment to make because mm. homeschooling has been a push or charter schools and homeschooling, <coughs> excuse me, has been a push for a, a long time in different communities. But there is that kind of idea of the lone student not interacting, not having social skills, not, you know, oh, it's not it's not OK. But no, it's not I good. have met so many homeschooled kids who are totally fine. You know, no. I mean, the thing that it's they didn't the run surface. into they to, was... They know how to interact with adults, but they don't know how to interact with peers, and that's the problem. They know how to interact with adults who are usually, like, kind and thoughtful, and it's Giving them when they a interact with people... Perspective generally... of what their life is going to be like. <laughs> so I, I know some homeschooled uh, adults now who are homeschooled uh, as children um, their entire career who are actually... They're, they're great. And there, there's a couple reasons for that. So one is their mother was a, an actual professional teacher who was pissed off at the school district and quit to homeschool like her children. Out. Right. Yeah. So she she was a professional instructor. So she was able to get them on that system. But the other thing is from day one, they had extracurriculars. So they still had almost every single day of the week. They had groups of, of children their age that they were interacting with. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you still can maintain that, then it, it mm -hmm. absolutely does make sense. And yeah. so, it, yeah, it, it's you can't tell. There's no difference. But I think and that's I, that's really that's the that's the thing that that everyone's afraid about right now. Right. Is that you don't have your social interaction. because right. We don't so, have those either. <laughs> so, so, like... so I'm just going to ask a quick question here about the Western settlers or the small nomadic bands of people who adventured, not adventured, ventured into yeah. different distant lands yeah. as small pods yeah. without extensive socialization. 
they, you know, must have led to completely dysfunctional societies and people. Like, how could any civilization come out of these groups, small groups of people who were relatively isolated from others with no communication, even less access to others in the world than we have today? Come on. Well, like, okay, to be fair... Well, we're ruined! Fair, we're ruined! Wait a oh second, my God. wait a second. Wait, <laughs> but, but to be fair, they were all a little bit nuts. Okay. Okay, there is the nuts. And then the <laughs> other... Okay, another part of this. There they are very people... very literate. They're very they're, literate. They're, they're literate, but not always. No, no, no. Not no. So, so, like, so, one of the like, most wait, amazing wait. accounts of California's first arrival is from the daughter of... This guy's like a miner or a lumberjack or something. I don't... He's going to try to make farms. She's documenting in her diary in like illustrative articulation words, language yes. of, of the <laughs> seas of wildflowers and, and how like she's, just, it's like a sea of purple and then there's streams of yellow and then there's an orange band beyond that. And she's basically articulate or describing for the first time, something that's now lost in California was the pre grasslands. Yeah. When wildflowers filled the valley, and and it's also showing like, oh, there's different soil conditions that these different wildflowers are adapting to, and but it's just she's not saying that, but she's like noticing that they all these seems to sort of run together in these streams. This person like, who was able books, to write and didn't have anything to do, to do except look and read, <laughs> looking and reading. This is how the world was. We were actually in the world we were in, and uh, then. And the other, the other thing I've, the other thing I've thought about, are people saying this year of missing out on school is going to really affect their children's future. It's going to affect all. Yeah. There they're, they're are lots gonna, of people. Not going to make it. They're not going to make top, it. Top tier. Ever. Not top tier anymore. It's over. No, oh, I mean, in the nest. It's over. Ben in the nest. Go, go start another. Go start another hatch. <laughs> Nobody's ever been held back a grade, right? Ever. Yeah, I know. Like, I was. There we go. Uh, but right. I skipped a grade before I got held back a grade. <laughs> oh, they were like, take backsies. <laughs> yeah, it was. No, so I skipped a grade, and then I had a year where I was, like, really sick in the middle of the school year and missed so much school that I couldn't catch up and had oh, to repeat. Oh, interesting. But I had skipped, I had skipped a, my, like, I skipped first grade or something. I skipped some year where, like, whatever it is where they're supposed to teach you how to read. And I already read fluently, whatever young age that was. So they're like, we don't have anything to teach your child this year because we teach reading and he's reading. So yeah. we're going to move him up. And my mother's like, oh, he'll be the youngest. To and then by the time I finished school, I actually left school a little early. But <laughs> but I had I both skipped and been held back uh, later. So. Like, just do the things that work for the student at the time. But people have also completely missed out on education because of famine, because of war, because oh, of yeah. genocide. Be there are so many things that have happened around the world that kids have lived through yeah, and ended up fine as, I mean, yes, with some baggage. For sure, uh, but people make it example. past. And if there's something to learn and a, and a person needs it, they will learn it. They'll learn and it. I just feel this, this, it's a false flag that kids are not, that this year is going to ruin. Yeah. I'm like, well, and yeah. that's the other thing that I keep thinking about is that when we were in school, when all three of us were in school, I'm willing to bet that what we were learning at grades are not what kids are learning in their current grades now. I know this. No. I've seen the work. It depends. And it depends the, on the school The system. expectations for kids are, at least in my experience, Very I high. can say in California, the, the expectations and the and the kind of the watermarks that they use are are way higher than what the yeah. expectation. I mean, when I was in kindergarten, I was learning how to like script, like just make letter shapes with my hand that were just they were they look terrible. But we would spend like two days practicing our A's, just drawing an A over and over, right? But like kids in kindergarten have started reading some of them. And it's that's why I feel I'm not too too worried because I feel like there's plasticity there that or there should be plasticity there that isn't there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah and, and you also, uh, this is like a very. They'll catch up. Uh, 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 the extreme version of this tale is the Holocaust survivors who were children mm-hmm. at the time. You know, one of which, uh, at least George Soros, is like one of the richest uh, men in America. You, you know, you are not necessarily limited by, but could be inspired by. I actually have a feeling we're going to get a great wave of people who uh, are studying viruses. Virology is going to be yeah, a thing the that interests. is very prescient in the minds of today's youth and and wanting to tackle and prevent a pandemic so that mommy's not mad all the time and daddy doesn't lose his job and I'm not allowed to play with my friends because that was awful and it that imprint is going to probably give us a great generation of people dedicating themselves to the science of this uh hopefully this is hopefully. how about technology I, I, I just yeah and I, I better want... technology too I wonder the generation if... that survived the 1918 flu, the Kansas-based Spanish flu, was the most pro-science generation. Huh. They're the ones that were all backed and, be- mm. and behind and funded and we'll pay the taxes for going to the moon, 100% behind it, adapted every new appliance and technology that they could because they believed in science. They believed in technology. And then at some point we got the... We have this weird wishwash in this modern age of just thinking technology is magic and it's just something that's inevitable and it just happens. <laughs> like it's ridiculous how uh, how how this generation, in some aspects, treats science and and how it is completely reliant upon it on the other. I wonder if the time, because there are a lot of kids who they're at school doing, I mean, at home doing their school. They're getting their assignments done probably in a quarter of the time that they would actually be spending at school. And then, you know, their parents might be working and these kids are like, okay, what do I do now? You know, maybe they're just on the Internet, but maybe kids are exploring things that they wouldn't necessarily get a chance to explore otherwise. How many new interests and, you know, new ways of thinking are kids going to have coming out of this that maybe they wouldn't have had otherwise because they wouldn't have had the deep dive or the time to really spend on things. The same way that people are like, oh, my pandemic project. We don't really think about, you know, what are kids doing and do they have that kind of intense uh, in, Michael Gibson intense time in something. In the uh, YouTube chat room, it's not that big a deal. Check with any military kid. I was in 13 different schools by the time I got to 10th grade. <laughs> Some postings yeah. are up before the school year is done. And yeah, yeah. then you move. Uh, I, w- I wouldn't say that's idealized. Um, but, it's not uh, idealized, but it's it, but, pe- kids Kids make it make it work. You learn, you do. Yeah, you do. And you, Families make it work. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I have like this... I have this desire to uh, to have kids educated without having to go to school and just getting to do recess. And it doesn't work. It's still a childhood dream of mine. I want the education. I don't like sitting in a classroom. And recess is awesome. If there's a way to combine those uh, someday, then, then we will have the perfect educational system. I would take classes constantly if I didn't have to do assignments. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just attend lecture and yeah. go yeah. to lab, if I could do labs and lectures and not ha- have to turn anything in or take any tests, I would I would constantly be in school. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think and I think that happens. I think that actually honestly does happen if you have and I'm going to sort of uh, straw man it a little bit. But if you have a parent who is a Ph.D. in life sciences, say. Uh, just going on a camping trip or, uh, on a road trip or just being in nature, you're getting that you're getting lessons without assignment. You were getting pointing out, Hey, by the way, do you notice how this, uh, creature seems to be staying over here and that one is up in the thing and yet they're, 
They, it, when this one talks, the other one looks around. When that one talks, the other one pays. They're paying attention to each other. Why do you think that is? Or have you noticed the variation in these leaves? Why? What's the yeah. benefit of having different leaves? Like if you have somebody who's pointing out the questions as you go along as a child, that is some of the best education because kids love finding solutions. They, you give, yeah. you make a kid curious, they're going to apply their 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 little antikythera brains to it. They're, Gears will oh start gosh. spinning and then they'll... That's what Kai has. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Kai absolutely has it. Yeah. He he does need other very yeah. geeky I've had, kids I've tried to, to hang out with because he has comment. so much to talk about. <laughs> he does, but I've, I've tried to... I remember a couple of times I've seen Kai. I've done like a throwaway comment where I've said something. He's like, I have three follow-up questions. <laughs> like, uh-oh. <laughs> no, I didn't really want to... I was just saying a thing. It's like, no, no, no. But when you said that, did you mean this, this, or this? I was like, oh, you know what? I don't know. I have to think about it. He's going to keep Kirsten, you on your toes, man. Kirsten, take the kid. All right, before I teach him bad things. <laughs> Come back, Kiki. Oh, he already has my pin code. He doesn't have the card yet, but he has the pin code. <laughs> Um, I was just thinking recently, actually, I, I'm very curious. Um, Kiki, do you know if Kai's getting assignments over spring break? And this is why I ask, because... No, I don't think so. Okay, good. Because I'm sure there are some schools out there that assigned mm-hmm. homework over winter break, assigned homework over spring break. And yeah. when you're working, when you're already doing school from home, yeah, then that's break? not a break. Which also, I think, points um, a very clear finger at the uh, how crappy homework is. Like I, I think yeah. homework is so, homework's got to go. A homework's got to go. Just blanket well, statement. But beyond that, yeah. um, I think that this is a really good example. Like all those people who are struggling homeschooling right now, um, recognize that that's what we ask parents to do all the time because you get this With huge homework, homework packet okay. and you're yeah. expected as the parent to facilitate that from home. So three things. One, <laughs> one homework is conditioning a future workforce to work overtime without getting paid. <laughs> that's why, that's why we do that. We have to, we're training the future generation to do their job by attrition because there's not enough hours in the day to actually complete their tasks. Do you think teachers of the past actually bought into that <laughs> philosophy? No, no. I can't okay. believe so, any of my teachers so, actually believing that. So but actually, the second thing is... The teachers have been taken advantage of as well. The second thing yeah. is that System most man. homework is not tested for time. Meaning right. teachers assign homework, but they actually have vague estimations of how much time those tasks take. They may think they're giving a half hour of hardy homework for the kid, yeah. and it's actually an hour and a half. And yeah. you know what? Three other classes gave 15-minute homeworks that were yeah. all in a half an hour. Yeah. And the kid comes home and suddenly has a six-hour schedule of homework that they're supposed to complete that night. Yeah. So I've actually what? gone. I've actually cut my kids off. Uh, I've done this before where my daughter was like working. She did her math. She was working on Zing. She was working on this other project. I'm like, you're done. You you spent two hours doing homework. That's the limit. I'm not letting you do any more. But by the way, she was very into school. I'm like, I'm writing a note right now to all of your teachers. You can show them that we spent two hours doing homework and I cut you off. And anything that get, didn't get done is because I refused to let you. Because it was ridiculous. And it's a real problem because teachers don't confer with other teachers about right. how much homework each other are giving, let alone know how much time it takes to do the assignments that they're throwing out there. So, yeah, I say and never do homework. And it doesn't take the same, every child the same amount of time no. to do it. And then I was like, well, what did you do, do in class like- today? We had a birthday party and we had cake. That's what you did in class? Yeah. And then at the end, they handed us the assignment. I'm, there's a okay okay all right I can't I can't do this on but this is not your job teacher this is for you that's not your job to have the cake party and then send the homework home for them to do it on their own they need- I feel like if there are projects reports projects things that 
can't get done in class, that there's just, I mean, the amount of stuff that teachers are required to teach these days, teach to the test, get the material that's required. Like you said, the students are held to a very high bar now, Ah. right? And uh, so the material, there's a lot of material that needs to be covered. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen all the time. And if the work can't get done in class, then there has to be, okay, yeah. well, you, ha- you have to get it done because this is the process that, as a teacher, I think is going to help you learn the material. So how does it, I, I think busy work is homework is awful. Just something yeah. like sending kids home with a hundred addition problems. Mm-hmm. That's what teachers used to do to me because mm-hmm. they were like, oh, you already know how to do this. We'll do more. And it, yeah. So I'd sit for hours you know, just doing all these problems, right? And that was no fun. It taught me to hate math. But if you if you teach a child the the work ethic of this is a project and you know, you need to work on this, you need to learn this. And if it does take extra time, you know, maybe I can work with you on that extra, but there is going to be some possible homework to get that understanding in, but yeah, I, I think, you According know, Michael, this is Michael Gibson. Sometimes you got to work at home. You got to get it done. Michael Gibson chat room. School is based on the lowest common denominator. The class has to keep up, uh, keep up, uh, keep pace with the slowest student. The bright ones get bored. City of Davis is a little strange. We have the highest per capita of PhDs in a town anywhere in the United States because it's a small town with a big university. Yeah. The, the thing that happens here is the the that that trend of keeping up with the student the students getting bored they try not to keep the students bored so they're always like a year or two ahead of what the normal curriculum would be for that age group and if you if you transfer into this school or if you're just not you don't have the phd you got a working class parent who's like i don't know what your homework means go you you took the class you figure it out then it becomes very easy to fall behind. But, uh, but and the pressure mounts too, because yeah, like Kiki's saying, like you were saying, you have that much more content you need to get them through. And if most of your students have that parent at home who's like, this is all the family's priority is you doing really well in school, they're all going to be showing up with that homework. And then the teacher thinks, oh. It was easy. Four hours of homework was no problem. Fine, apparently. Yeah. So yeah. I think part of the the conversation, though, is also related to developmental understanding of mm-hmm. children. And the the when I say get rid of homework, I mainly mean get rid of homework under fifth grade. <laughs> it's it's really I didn't get rid of all of it. I don't believe in it. I, My, I to the get school rid of a ties lot in. Of it. Yeah, the school <laughs> ties in right now. They weren't doing homework previously. I think uh, they start. They allow teachers to start giving homework in the fifth grade. To get yeah, kids ready to get to get kids ready for junior high because in yeah. junior high all the teachers get teachers homework. stop doing their jobs. I, I think and just no, 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 sit, no, like, okay. here's what I you're think, supposed no, I, to I learn. Think... Take it home, do it there. No. I have we have teachers in our audience, and I don't want to dip to bad yeah. mouth teachers no, no. because <laughs> the teachers out there are doing a lot of work right now. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, but if, I mean, they they don't yeah. want to give homework. They that's ho- that's work that they have to do outside of school hours too. They have spent yeah. so much time correcting homework. So it's I think they're also they're specifically there are schools that have expectations. Okay, mm-hmm. all kindergartners have to take a pack at home a week. Like these are things that are that are put on some to schools teachers back do require to that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and and the the thing that I was trying to say about developmental expectations is that you know. When you're seven years old, you're not supposed to be sitting for six hours at all. So then if you're sitting for six hours straight at school and then you're just to go home and do a, sit a couple hours at the end and of the sit day. Down. Yes, exactly. That is not what your body is supposed to be doing. I and didn't you're come actually home till missing. the sun went down. And and I did get in trouble one time. Uh, I had a teacher turn over a desk. Turn over a desk in the middle of class turned my desk over because it was it didn't have a lift up top but it had a cubby hole uh desk turned the desk over and pulled out all of the crumpled up dittos of homework that i was supposed to take home 
Ditto was was uh, was a Xerox ditto. copy it's, machine. Yes. Ditto. Yes. yes, the Ditto machine. And Porta, yes. and it was just, and it was like she was even in awe <laughs> of how every single homework assignment that I had been given that entire never year home. was there and never left. Because I'm that like, sounds like my I'm son. on my time when I leave. I'm not on your. You don't have control. As soon as I leave that for this campus border, when I cross oh the border. God. It's mine. I'm free it's again. And I'm just not in, doing it. That is so funny because I swear, like, previous years, parents' night at the schools, mm-hmm. I, I would go in and be like, oh, this is great. I'd be like, this is where I sit. Be like, awesome. And his teacher would be like, oh, he's doing great. You know, sometimes doesn't seem to finish projects and things, doesn't, you know, finish all this stuff. And then... <laughs> I start looking through his folders and there's just sheets of work yeah, that's partially yeah. done and just yeah. left. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, huh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Just not finishing it. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> Gosh. But see, yeah, I do think that also like starting homework early builds expectation for later, right? Yeah. Like, because that's the other thing is when I was in high school, I had eight hours of homework a night yeah eight hours eight and hours I was that's school. ridiculous i was in school from 7 30 a.m to 3 30 p.m yeah and that's then i had eight hours of, of homework and i had multiple extracurriculars i played the saxophone i was in all like these these uh question, question. These bands in the community i volunteered at the zoo i had other stuff going on you volunteer mm-hmm. question have you ever worked overtime without getting paid Yes, yes. Okay. a lot. So you were trained, and the training worked. Oh, success. <laughs> the conditioning worked. I yeah, did my I job at work, college. and now I have all this other work to do. I'll just do it. It's kind of like homework. It's I the was in college, thing. and I was mm. shocked. It was, like, easy because... I, in high school, had... People, people are looking up ditto machines in the chat room. Oh, oh those no. ditto, <laughs> like a ditto. Um, <laughs> what the? <laughs> I would have seven academic subjects a day in oh high God. school, right? And so I would have to do the homework for seven academic subjects every night. And I could have four midterms in one day, right? Like, <sighs> crazy stuff would happen mm-hmm. like that. And so then when I went to college and I was like, oh, I only have two classes today? I only have three classes today. It was like, this is so, this is better. This is better. <laughs> still, remember- hours of, still hours of study, but you're, it's broken up in a way that is a bit more manageable. Yeah. Like, yes. yeah. I came from a pretty intense uh, high school system or school system in the city of Davis. Very intense. I, I technically dropped out, but then went to college to what would have been my senior year. And I, and I got this note in the margins from the teacher, like, thank you for using proper uh, grammar and punctuation throughout your entire paper. <laughs> and I'm like, what? What, what do you mean? <laughs> That's not, uh, how about the content of the extra existentialism versus the modern day ed in the way that the, no, that was like, thank you for using punctuation properly and grammar in the way that you would expect. There was a thank you in the margin from a teacher for the basic. So there was also like, I realized like not all schools are the same. Not they, all they, teachers are the same. Not all schools no. are the same. All the same way that we're saying not all students are the same. You know, there is variation and we yes. are talking about something that has been institutionalized and systematized. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are reams of reams of documents on the science of education and how to teach and how to do all these things and you know i think a part of like the whole homework thing there's the flipped classroom that teachers have been trying to do many teachers have adopted over the last couple of couple of decades which is to allow kids to do the work in the classroom and maybe like go home and watch a video or something as opposed to doing the work but just like go go home and read and then come back and do the work in class that kind of stuff so the project and the work happens in class while the teacher's there as opposed to lecture in class and make the make the student go and do work outside that's one way one methodology that's come out less effective if you don't have somebody who when you 
get yeah. stuck and ask a question to. Mm-hmm. But then I think yeah. it stops working. And if you're at home and your parent, again, is a PhD in the subject that you're doing. That's great. You're fine. But... You get the homework done in half an hour because it's, it's made clear, maybe better than the teacher or the textbook did, or the ditto mimeographed Xerox paper copy thing that you had to fill out or whatever. Back in the ancient days when we mm-hmm. did everything by mm-hmm. chisel. We hammer, we when you had to go to the library stone. and check out encyclopedias Wait. to do your report. And didn't have Google. But but if you don't have those resources, like it can be very... Encyclopedia Britannica. Very limiting uh, how the effectiveness of... My report on Denmark in the sixth grade was amazing thanks to the Encyclopedia Britannica. I will have you know. Yeah. Mine I was got very my dad excited. did buy mine from was, a did I tell encyclopedia you this already? Mine salesman. was Argentina. My, mine was Argentina. Yeah. Mine and was Denmark. Argentina? That's Argen, uh, Argentina. Argentina. <laughs> uh, Argentina. But, uh, but we it was did like, only have I, the library for but, so long. No, but that's what I said. I know I wasn't laughing. I was saying that what, I experienced that. But the thing that I discovered, the first thing that shot out at me, because we all had to come up. This is the year you all rep- you Everybody has to represent a country, pick a country, or it's assigned to you, and then you research it and you talk, come up and talk about the country. And I was like this. Argentina is a country in South America that has had more coups than any other country. <laughs> Most leaders die by associate uh, assassination. Which is why I'm making forage of mo- movements right now. And that was my that was my presentation. I can see it. That was my presentation. I tell you more, but I can't stand still long enough. And we're big into cattle. And it was like that was it. Like I was like <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> and I did, I did, uh, yeah, I did uh, pass that somehow. Good. Uh, Made the teacher laugh. Uh, oh man! Assassination oh and god. assassination. That's yes, so honey. funny. Uh, I think we've done a three-hour plus show now. I think oh, I need to go. Three-hour show. Oh, it's three very late. Three-hour show. It's yeah. been really great talking with you guys. Um. And everyone in the chat rooms. Oh my goodness. Ditto. Ditto, ditto. Isn't Ditto a character in Pokemon? I think it's a big uh, world. It's probably lots of things. I don't yeah. know. Um, yes, it is. A it normal is. type Pokemon. <laughs> That's a thing? Normal type? <laughs> Normal type, yes. Well, that was just funny because none of the dittos I ever got were normal type. Like, always there was part of it that would just be smudged. Like, so the first step of this instruction is very clear. And then the second was like double, triple, left, schmear. How am I supposed to work with this? Ooh, Ditto is a unique Pokemon because it can breed with any Pokemon in a, uh-huh. in a daycare center. <laughs> Regardless of its gender, except for another ditto. What? All right. Mm-hmm. Yes. On that note, on that note say goodnight, um, Blair. Yes. Well, no, Kiki was going to say something. What? I was just going to say, yes, we have next week in two weeks. We have... Um, how can we have next week in two weeks? We that no we, totally next week we next sense. week I do not have an interview planned. Um, but in two weeks we are... Speaking with the author of Beloved, Beloved Beasts, Beasts, Michelle. Have we talked N- to her before? Nihuis. No. Okay. I don't oh. believe we have. And this is a a book. What's that? Vibrant about? history of the modern conservation movement through the lives and ideas of the people who built it. Mm. Conservation, Blair. Neat. Yes. Conservation, fighting for life beasts. in an age of extinction. There's hair. Yes, that's in two weeks. It'll be fun Horrible stuff. Fighting. Okay, try oh. it again. Say goodnight, Blair. Goodnight, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Goodnight, Justin. <laughs>
Good night, <laughs> Kiki. I had a hiccup. <laughs> I know, I tried Good to pause, night, but... everyone. Have a wonderful night. We will see you in a week, we do hope. Thank you for joining us. Stay healthy, stay well, stay informed, and... Happy Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Look at the Irish to you. Urgh.